Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast of board gamers in the insane fun we have at the table together. This is hey, Chris. This is Anthony. And this is episode number 300, top 100 board games of all time. We'd like to thank our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a live streamed episode. All right, Anthony, we are finally here. We are live. We are doing the top 100 board games of all time, our number 300 episode. Yeah, we've been talking about this thing for weeks. Uh, if you've listened to us, <laughs> watched us, done anything, even remotely near BGA, um, you knew this was coming. So <laughs> you probably didn't know we are going to do a video, though. We didn't tell you that. That was a secret. <laughs> yeah, Board Gamers Anonymous hits Twitch. And going forward, Board Gamers Anonymous is going to be streamed live. So if you love Board Gamers Anonymous, but you really also love BJ Live, where you actually get to see us do things, and there are pictures and images and random technological failures, <laughs> then you can join us each and every week, 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, to listen to, again, the latest and greatest in board gaming, but now on a live Twitch stream, or, of course, as always, on your favorite podcast player and YouTube. Yeah, yeah, we're going to be here every week. We, we've got the equipment, we've got the system, we've got the templates down. So, hey, why not do the video along with the podcast since we're already doing video every week? So, it's, it's going to be a blast. Um, our plan is to be on the Board Game Arena uh, stream. If that changes, we'll let you guys know. But that is the goal, and then you'll be able to find us all the places. Absolutely. All right, Anthony, before we get into our mammoth, just universally loved episode <laughs> number 300, uh, is there anything from BGA that everyone should know about before we move forward? Well, uh, if you're watching this, if you're among the few watching this right now, um, we have a contest that ends on Wednesday. Now, when the podcast comes out, it may or may not still be running. So if you're hearing this on your podcast player, you might have a couple of hours to enter the contest. This mm -hmm. is our listeners' top 20 games of all time. Um, yes. Make sure you check that out. If you haven't filled it out yet, if you're listening to this bright and early on Wednesday, you might have a little bit of time. It's sometime Wednesday afternoon it turns off. So get in there. Do it. We've got a couple hundred entries already <laughs> from people all over the globe telling us what their 20 favorite games of all time are. If you do that and just give your name and email address along with it, you're mm -hmm. entered to win a game. And so we will let you all know who wins that game next week on episode 301 uh, when we do our top sure. 20 listeners games. But yeah, thank you everybody who entered. Always a lot of fun to do that. And I'm looking forward to sifting through all of it <laughs> this weekend. Yeah, so again, one of our favorite episodes of all time. Love hearing from all of you out there. Thank you all for joining us and posting to the contest. So Anthony... We do, are doing so much on here. Obviously, Twitch, you mentioned, and each and every week we're going on there. So we finally hit number 300. We're pretty happy about that. It took a long time to get here. Seven years, my friend. Seven years plus. Yep. Uh, anything you want to say? Anything you want to think about? Any kind of flashbacks for 300 episodes, seven plus years? Well, I've lost most of my memory in 2020, so I don't really remember <laughs> the rest of them. Uh, <laughs> I remember around the time we stopped playing games. Like two fifty five. No, it's just, <laughs> no. It's been a blast. Obviously, we've been doing this for forever. You know, in these terms, uh, back in twenty thirteen, sure. we started August twenty thirteen, and to get to three hundred is kind of crazy. I don't like we've done one hundred episode. You know, that episode we did two hundred. We did two fifty last year, and they're all like, oh, these are milestones. And I don't know why three hundred feels different. Like you've somehow <laughs> reached a level like nobody does three hundred. Well, we have, so <laughs> it's awesome. Yeah, I think it was really a lot of pressure over the last 20 or 30 episodes. I just kept going, right. why can't we just hit 300? <laughs> why, why, why? So I'm really happy that we're here. I'm happy that we've gotten to spend seven plus years ago with you. I'm happy that we have 300 plus episodes plus all the Patreon episodes. Again, if you want to listen to those, patreon.com slash BGA. Obviously, all the articles on boardgamersanonymous.com. You know, our good friends at Kick and the Habit, Anthony and Jason. Obviously, our older, older podcasts, all about Kickstarter. Kick and the Habit, way back in the day. 
So a lot of stuff out there. We're so glad that you've joined us for all of this. And obviously, this is one of our best episodes. We go painstakingly through all of the board games we played in seven plus years and pull together our top 100 list and torture ourselves over it for several weeks, if not months. Yep. And even at the last second, make changes because... Yeah, it's an important list. I, I literally made five separate changes in the last hour and a half. As I was going through and adding all the photos into OBS, I was like, ooh, I'm going to move this one and this one. And oh, that's a duplicate. I got to find something else for that. And y'all yeah, see, some of them will be surprises and some you won't even know. <laughs> and, and again, so just a little caveat before we get into the feature review, which is the top 100. I think it's good to remember a couple of things going into it. One, despite seven plus years and 300 plus episodes, we haven't played every game. Yes. So if you get through 100 and you're like, hey, I didn't hear that game, it's probably a good chance we haven't played it yet. Mm -hmm. So if we haven't played it yet, please hit us up and let us know that we should be playing that game. Now, beyond that, so to speak, we want to let you know that, you know, obviously with everything that's going on with COVID... We're not getting as many huge games to the table as we once did. So check back with us on episode, what, 350 or 400? 400, yeah. <laughs> when you might see a lot more 2020 games pop up there. So, yeah. So, again, this list is a great conversation that we're having with you. We want to hear so much back from you. So, again, if there's something missing, hit us up. Let us know. We'll get it to the table. And then it might hit our list next year. Yeah. Yeah. You'd be surprised. Some of these games shoot way up. Definitely. So with that said, obviously everything, again, we can go on for hours about everything the podcast means to us. But again, you mean so much to us. So let's actually get onto the episode. All right, Anthony. So here we are. Finally, episode 300, our feature review, the top 100 board games of all times boom let's do it whoa <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah so we have this kind of a dueling top 100s here the way we've set it up and i think this is actually the first time we've done this because yes we did a combined top 100 we did a communal top 100 when daniel and drew were on the show we did splitting it in half where you and i each recorded separate chunks um Yes. We've never done both 100s alternating throughout the episode. So this will be interesting. <laughs> so let us know if you like it. If you're listening, we're going to make sure that you understand each step of the way. So we're not going to lose you. Definitely stay tuned and stay subscribed to the podcast. Absolutely. Yep. So what we're going to have here is on each side, we're going to have ten, a list of 10 at a time um, for technical reasons. And we will absolutely read them off and describe what we're talking about for everybody who's listening. And then we will have the game pop up here in the middle so you can see what we're talking about. So if you are listening to the podcast and it's just audio and you want to see the game boxes and see the lists as we go through it, the best way to do that is to head over to our Twitch channel and watch the replay or head to our YouTube channel where I'm going to upload the file. And you can watch all of this happen with all of our hand gestures and our eyebrow raises at our, each other's <laughs> changes, <laughs> our scowls. Um, so yeah, let's dive right in. Uh, I'm going to kick things off. All right. Yes, sir. All right. My number 100 is Yokohama, which we just played on BGA Live, I don't know, like four or five weeks ago um, from Hisashi Hayashi. Uh, you are bouncing your guy around all these different places on the board, kind of like Istanbul, and then you are taking actions by placing your various... Um, uh, assistance down and then powering them up there's like 13 different things you can do in this game but it's all about the efficiency of how you do it and i love efficiency engines finding the most efficient path to go through so that's why this one's number 100 for me all right and number 100 for me is revolution with an exclamation point obviously there is some nostalgia this is a game that anthony and i met over way back in the day but it's also one of the best examples of blind bidding and of area control. And if you throw in the expansions to it, it really has a lot of replayability. It's a game that does not get enough attention and is really a great game. All right. 
Uh, next up for me is Dominant Species at number 99. Uh, this is a big, sprawling area control game. It takes like six, seven hours to play. It's fantastic. You're playing one of these different types of animal um, species, and they are all very unique and asymmetrical and brutally mean. It's a brutally mean game. It's like one of the first Euros I played where I was just like, man, this is mean. <laughs> So, um, it is. I, I do love it. I have a copy, and I have the, the new marine version on the way as well. Once they uh, get that done, number ninety nine for me is Dixit Journey. There are a lot of Dixits out there, and they're all very good. And Dixit Journey isn't radically different, but Dixit Journey lets you do two things. First, it lets you play with a lot of players, which is great. And second, it's my favorite artwork out of any of the Dixits. Now, there's been a, a few recent expansions that have been great but as far as if you needed to pick a dixit and again it's a party game where you put together some beautiful artwork throw it down give a clue and let everybody guess too many right it's bad for you too many wrong bad for you but just enough and it really makes a great game so love the artwork love the gameplay if i'm gonna party it's gonna be with dixit all right number 98 on my side is queenbra for, for from virginio gili and flamit Flaminia Brissini. Sorry about that. Um, <coughs> this is, not only is the artwork fantastic for a Euro, that's just, this is like a, a whole new level when this came out, but the dice uh, allocation system and the way you get the cards uh, from the tableau that's there is just fantastic. Like, it's just a fantastic combination of these different mechanics. And the more you play, the more you uncover. First play of this, most people I know are just like, it's okay. But like, third, fourth play, you're like, wow, this is fantastic. And so this game has definitely moved up on my um, top games because of that. My number 98 is Mysterium. Mysterium is a variation of Dixit, but instead of light, bright, and fancy and fun kind of cards, this is dark and devious cards. You are a spirit trying to communicate to the psychic detectives where your murder happened, who did it, and then with what. So basically, it's Clue and Dixit stuck together, and it's a great game. A lot of setup for the game, but still a very great game. Uh, that's Mysterium. Party on. All right. Number 97 for me is Texas Showdown. <laughs> this is a trick-taking game. So, Chris, just put on the shock face. you got to do it for the... <laughs> that's our YouTube cover. Um, yeah, this is a game that... No! <laughs> Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is a YouTube... Or YouTube. This is a game that I uh, played at a friend's house. We we started playing a lot of different trick-taking games. We had a trick-taking day, actually. And it's just fantastic. I'm not going to go through all the mechanics of it, but if you can find a copy on Amazon and you like trick-taking games, this is one of my favorites. So that's Texas Showdown. <laughs> my number 97 is... A social deduction game. Strange enough, I have a social deduction game, and it's probably the finest social deduction game out there. First off, it's a really cool theme, Shadow Hunters. You have the shadow side and you have the shadow hunters, good versus evil. Now, typically that happens to a lot of social deduction games, but this game brings in neutral characters that either want to survive, want to die, or a number of other things, and that really throws the gameplay off. Beyond that, there's actual gameplay here. So how you take out other characters, different things you're able to pick up as far as equipment's concerned, it's radically different than any social deduction game out there. It's been around for some time, does not get the table time that it deserves. Shadowhunters, great game. Definitely check it out. All right, number 96 on mine is Navigador. It's a Matt Gertz game. Um, it's it, At one point I said this was my favorite Matt Gertz game. It's, I don't know that it mm -hmm. is anymore. I think there's one or more, one or possibly two more that are higher on the list now. <laughs> but it is very, very good and severely underplayed. I think I knew one person who owned a copy and we played it several times and I picked up a copy then. But I don't think I've ever met anybody else who has this. And you should check it out. So it's like an economic engine type of thing. Like you're buying and selling things as you move around this path. And you're trying to get to the end of the path first, but you're also trying to do a bunch of stuff along the way. So it is a fantastic mm -hmm. game. Well worth checking out. If you like Matt Gertz stuff, it definitely feels like one of his games. Navigador. Number 96 for me is Russian Railroad. This would probably be higher if it wasn't for the fact that German Railroads, which makes this game exquisite, just doesn't come and packed in the box. Right. It really is a great game. The idea of building these tracks out, picking up special abilities. It really is a wondrous game. Again, the expansions makes it so much better. 
But regardless, even the base game alone deserves to be in the top 100. Spoiler. Me too. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> All right. Number 95 on the list is Battlelore Second Edition. This is uh, Fantasy Flight took the Battlelore system, which had been used in all sorts of different stuff before they got their hands on it. They completely revamped, you know, everything about it, and they released it in the Terranoth universe, and then they promptly canceled it like 18 months later because Fantasy Flight. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it is one of my favorite two-player games, though. Like, it, if you're going to play miniatures on a, on a board, it's just... It's not super long. It's got a lot of depth to it. If you can get all the expansions, which are still somehow floating around out there, they're well worth picking up. And they're pretty inexpensive because they're super out of print. They stopped before they made those fourth and fifth factions. So no elves. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but you can get three of the factions. And I do have literally everything for this. And I absolutely <laughs> love it. So that's Battle or Second Edition. Number 95 for me is Yurg Dasil. Yurg Dasil is, again, another game that came out a long time ago, has, I guess, in part been forgotten. It got a reprint very quickly on Board Game Geek and then immediately sold out. So it's more than likely you've never gotten a chance to play this. It's a cooperative game about North mythology and fighting against Yurg Dasil, pretty much. The whole Earth Tree and Ragnarok and everything else that's coming down. It's a super fine co-op game. It really is astounding how good the game plays. And the AI in the game is great. It's really easy to kind of ramp up and make the game a lot more difficult. It was one of the first board game apps that I had and I absolutely loved. So I guarantee this will get reprinted at some point. And when it does, absolutely pick this up. It's great. Yeah, I snagged one of those BGG copies and they were hard to get. So. <laughs> <laughs> It was you. It was me. <laughs> uh, number 94 on my list is Lisboa from Vitala Cerda. Uh, this, is, this is a fantastic game. I love this game. The fact that it's this far down on my list speaks more to the quality or at least how much I like some of his other games, which we'll get to later. But this is a spectacular game. I just don't get enough time to play it. I, it's just one of those games I had trouble getting to the table. It's Every time I want to bring it out, I have to completely relearn it from scratch because it's complicated enough. And that's fine and all, but it just has made it hard for me to play it as much as I want to. But I absolutely love it when I do get a chance to play it. And the solo mode is very good. So that is Lisboa. I'm telling Vital. I'm just saying. <laughs> I think we represent pretty well for him. My, <laughs> my number 94 is Mission Red Planet 2nd Edition. There are some corrections and some upgrades in the 2nd Edition. It makes it much better of a game. It had been out of print for a long time, at least the first edition. So when the second edition came out, I loved it. It was the idea of this really wondrous Victorian kind of space mindset about landing on Mars, but also all the trouble that goes into it. It's basically an area control game, but you get to pick roles and the roles really mess with other players. And it's a tremendous amount of fun and a wonderful production. That's Mission Red Planet, second edition. Great game. Yeah. Uh, number 93 for me, At the Gates of Loyang. This is the first Uwe Rosenberg game I actually played. Um, old friend Drew used to be on the show with us. He uh, brought it and like jammed it down my throat, basically. Like, You're playing this. <laughs> and I'm really glad he did. I really enjoy it. Um, it. It's got all the farming and vegetables that you expect from an Uwe game, but it's very different, <laughs> mechanically speaking. Like The points are very tight. You have to purchase them. Um, the card mechanics are fantastic. This is one of my favorite solo versions of a Euro period, just because of the way yes. the card tableau and how you're purchasing those cards and utilizing them within the, your own personal build out. Um, yeah, this is, it keeps coming back and I'm glad they reprinted it a few years ago so you can actually find it now. Uh, that's at the gates of Lu Yang. Agreed. All right. My number 93 is Memoir 44. This was a Days of Wonder game when Days of Wonder was its own company, and the idea of war games would never hit a board game table, so to speak. But Memoir 44 did the impossible. It's a great board game that's playable by almost anybody, and yet at the same time, it has the incredible depth to be recognized and accepted by war gamers. And you get little green men that go pew pew. So um, you get to play with plastic, you know, army men. So that's awesome. So, yeah, great, great game and like numerous, numerous expansions that really build upon the game. It's fantastic. 
All right, number 92 for me is Lorenzo Il Magnifico. So um, we have the design team behind Queen Bra, which I just talked about, plus Simone Luciani uh, creating one of the best Euros of the last few years. It's incredibly tight. It is difficult to get things done, and I love games that do that to me, <laughs> that make me make hard decisions. Um, it does that cool thing with the dice where those are your actions, but they're shared. Everybody has the same action points every round, which is fantastic. And then if you throw the expansion in on top of that, which is also still available, it levels it up even higher. This was actually one of my essential expansions that we talked about last week on episode 299. So Lorenzo Wheel Magnifico, absolutely fantastic. My number 92. All right. My number 92 is a slight variation of Memory of 44. This is Rivet Wars Eastern Front. So Rivet Wars Eastern Front was a chibi version of World War II, or maybe Memoir 44, where these really cute, adorable World War II characters fighting it out. It's adorable, it's cute, and it's actually a really competent war game so to speak you build up your little armies you attack the other side you try to meet objectives it's really everything that memoir 44 is but adorable <laughs> so yeah <laughs> check it out so it's one step higher because it's adorable As adorability gets you one step higher people <laughs> keep that in mind all right for me number 91 is going to be tekinu obelisk of the sun this is the new game from daniel tashini and david turchi this actually just came out so it kind of shot right yes. up on my list and that's based pretty heavily on the solo because, as you can all see, not a lot of multiplayer gaming going on right now. Um, first play of this game, very difficult to wrap your head around. Lots and lots of different things going on on the board, but the more you play it, the more the inner mingling of these different mechanics makes sense. And it's kind of just gotten under my skin and in my head, and I just I want to keep playing it. So, Tekino, I, I actually expect this to go higher next year, especially if I get a chance to bring it out to play with other people. Um, as I catch up on things. So, yeah, keep an eye on this one. This is really good if you haven't had a chance to play it yet. Tekinu. My number 91 game is Star Trek Attack Wing. Now, the flypad system that was developed from Ares Games utilized here in Star Trek. And the reason why it gets a spot, first off, I'm a big Star Trek fan, but primarily what's great about this and what keeps it in its own category is is that you could add significant amounts of crew, technology, and just random trickery throughout the game. So think about those giant capital ships and all the people that you want on them and special abilities to be able to do things. In addition to all that, the campaign mode and their live game events with a giant Deep Space Nine, a giant Borg Cube, they really went all out. The paint job is not as good as some other miniature games out there, but the fun is definitely there. That's number 91, Star Trek Attack Wing. All right, moving on to our 90 to 81 lists. And jumping ahead here. Uh, so number 90 for go. me is Glenmore 2 Chronicles. Um, you'll notice this is just replacing Glenmore from last time, about the same spot on the list, because uh, mm -hmm. Glenmore is fantastic, but it's been out of print for like 10 years. And they released Glenmore 2 on Kickstarter. And it is better. <laughs> it, like Sometimes they upgrade things and you're like, eh, but this is actually better. So it adds new mechanics. It adds all these chronicles. Some of them are very, very good. Some of them are fine. Um, even the base game, though, with the extra board and being able to move around and, and get those bonuses is just fantastic. And then the expansion now coming out on Kickstarter looks really good as well. So Glenmore 2, very, very solid. Looking forward to playing it more. And I expect it to move up higher because I'm going to get a chance to play it more because it's newer and there's more stuff to do. All right, my number 90 is Star Wars X-Wing Miniatures Game. So remember we just talked about adorableness? Well, <laughs> here we go. Star Wars X-Wing Miniatures Game has really adorable miniatures. I mean, they're super cool, and the paint jobs are fantastic. I mean, in fact, you could just collect this game just for the miniatures alone. That being said, it's part of the flight pet system, again, that Star Trek Attack Wing used. But also, the gameplay is a lot tighter and in fact, you could argue it's even a lot better in some circumstances. So Star Trek Attack Wing, good game. Star Wars X-Wing miniature game, slightly better. And again, it has some insanely big capital ships that you can pick up. But both of these are great. This one's a little bit better. My number 90, Star Wars X-Wing miniatures game. All right. So for me, my next game on the list, number 89, is... 
if I can get the slideshow here. There we go. Azul, Summer Pavilion. Uh, Michael Kiesling has released three different versions of Azul now. I own all three, and they are unique enough <laughs> to warrant that. Um, but this is my favorite of the batch. I think it adds just this interesting enough layer on top of the base version of Azul without completely overhauling the mechanics. I actually liked uh, Stained Glass a lot when it came out, but it was a little bit harder to play with sure. the family. This one actually plays pretty well with the family. Um, sure. So it's kind of in the middle in terms of weight and just a little bit higher than the base game in terms of just general enjoyment for me. So it is my favorite of the Azuls. And uh, it's here at 89. Azul, Summer mm -hmm. Pavilion. All right. My number 89 game is Star Wars The Queen's Gambit. So this version, not as cute no. <laughs> as the other versions, but what's really interesting about this Grail game, and by Grail game, I mean it's out of print forever and probably never coming back. There's been a slight lighter version of this that did come out recently, but this is the granddaddy of them all. I mean, in fact, when you get this to the table, there's nothing like this. You actually have multiple levels in which you're moving trips on. You have big battles with a lot of miniatures fighting it out. You have your Jedi heroes and your Sith Lord here fighting it out. And a really wondrous interactive gameplay. You're using these multi-use cards to make decisions on which of these different battlefields you're going to move upon and, you know, have to sacrifice the other. So which actions do you take? You get to be this, like, supreme general in the game. And even if it's not Star Wars themed, this would have been a fantastic game anywhere with any type of IP or no IP whatsoever. That is Star Wars, The Queen's Gambit. Man, that's a big box. Number 89. Eating up our screen. That's a huge yeah. box. <laughs> <laughs> that's how big it yeah. is. I have Star Wars Risk, which is based on this. And it's good. It's yeah. fine. It's good with the kids. It's not amazing. I really want to play this. <laughs> yeah, my shout out to Dave, who actually got to pick it up. I'm just amazed. Yeah, I know. I've been tempted a few times, but it's just a little too much money. Yes. All right. Number 88 for me is Clinic Deluxe. This one came out at the very beginning of uh, 2020. So got a chance to play it with several groups of people, including Chris. We all got to play this together when I visited um, back in February. <laughs> and this is the first of um, multiple Albin VR games on my list. He is one of my favorite designers. And this is by far the best looking and best production of his because he went all in. Big deluxe version, Eno Tool artwork, just fantastic overall presentation. And now there's like I don't know, like 15 modules for it with all the expansions on top of it. Just this fantastic yeah. game of logistics and building out this hospital and trying to manage patients coming in and having the right doctors in place and then paying the doctors and making sure it all balances out in the end. Um, some people see that and their eyes cross. I see it and I get very excited. So it is definitely in my top 100 clinic deluxe. Very cool. My number 88 game is High Heavens. This was a game Anthony and I played way back. <laughs> I think this has got to be like five or six years ago where we went to PAX East. And I was just blown away by this game. So you have these different pantheons of gods. And you had this really innovative ring system that showed off how much health they had. If they took damage, if they had armor, all these different status symbols as far as the gameplay is concerned. The miniatures were really good. The gameplay was great. It's a two-player game, almost think like battle chess as far as that's concerned. So this is an, yet another game that does not get the attention it deserves. High heavens, great game, so much fun. It's it's a mare trash in the best possible way. All right. So on my end of things, going way off in another direction, um, <laughs> 1846, The Race for the Midwest. This is uh, designed by Tom Lehman, but most importantly, it's an 18xx game. And it's the very first one I played um, a little over a year ago, I believe. So I don't know if this made my top 100 last year. I think it might have. But it is, it's actually a little bit different than a lot of the other ones. But I like it quite a bit that enough that I tracked down a copy. And it, it's just solid. And it's just funny to me that the designer of Race for the Galaxy made an 18xx game. I don't know why. It's just funny. And I can't get over <laughs> that. Um, if you're going to get into one to start, this is a great one. Some people will say 18 Chesapeake is a great one. I'm not going to go down that road. But... This is a very good one, and if, you, if it's in stock, if it's available in imprint, track it down. 1846. All right. My number 87 game is another Days of Wonder game back in the day when they were Days of Wonder. That's Shadows Over Camelot. This is another trader game, 
And somebody in the king's court is a traitor. While the rest of the knights are trying to figure that out, they have to defend Camelot and deal with all the various situations that are occurring. So, again, this is a precursor for a lot of great games like Battlestar Galactica. Mm -hmm. And, again, the idea is about meeting the different conditions or even among us, right? Yeah. These kind of situations where you got to hit the conditions but also deal with the trader at the same time. And the production is top-notch. It's amazing how good the production is. On top of which, the Merlin expansion even makes the game even better if it's possible. The game is kind of out of print, but if you ever get a chance to play or pick it up, I would highly recommend my number 87, Shadows Over Camelot. All right. Number 86, uh, another Tom Lehman joint, New Frontiers, the Race for the Galaxy board Ooh. game. Um, this is, it's basically, you know, it's the core mechanics of uh, Race for the Galaxy slash Puerto Rico, done as a board game version. And it's, it's really fantastically built. The main thing about it that's a little rough and makes it kind of expensive is just mm -hmm. jumbo pieces and these big massive boards. Right, so I don't see enough people owning it. I don't see it out as often because the box is so big for what it is. But don't let that deter you. It is a very good game. It is actually my favorite of the race role universe. If I'm going to pick one, um, just in terms of like getting one to the table because I'm you know I'm a board game guy, uh, and there's just a little bit more to it than that. Um, having never played Puerto Rico too, <laughs> I was like, this is great. So New Frontiers is my number eighty six. Very cool. I haven't played that yet. Looking forward to it. My number 86 is 878 Vikings Invasions of England. No, it's not a phone number, although I did think it was when I first saw it pop up on Kickstarter. <laughs> uh, what it is, is in fact one of, if not the best miniature games on the table. Again, it is a situational war game, so to speak done by Ares Games, and they did such a fantastic job. Again, this is another game that I would never even think about playing, not nonetheless purchasing. And again, it reenacts that whole situation where the Vikings were invading England, and obviously the battle back and forth. So you can play two players, you can play four players, you can customize your decks, you can add a lot of cultural and social kind of dynamics to the game. No matter what you do with this game, it is fantastic that is 878 vikings all right uh next up for me is number 85 space core 2025 to 2300 ad um another gmt game this one though is not like your typical gmt games this play is like a legit you know medium heavy board game and you have like these multiple different phases that you go through as you build out um your space ex space exploration force and there's even multiple boards in the box to go through and do this. So it's not this big, heavy, long GMT game. I, it's relatively quick and easy to learn, too, on top of that. And I was blown away. It's not what I expected at all. I'm really glad I picked it up, despite you know what it looks like um, just out of the box. And there's a new expansion coming down the pike, too, from the P500 system. Um, should be shipping sometime in the next six to nine months. Um, very excited to get this one back to the table more. That is Space Core. My number 85 is Battlelore 2nd Edition. You already heard Anthony talk about this. Again, this is Memoir 44, but in the fantasy version. And again, you're dealing with a wondrous card system in which you're able to move your troops in three different lanes. Again, this adds a lot of magic to the game, and it's just really a wondrous game. The Terranoff universe has never been played as well as it has here, with maybe one exception, but we'll see. <laughs> but nonetheless, Battle Wars 2nd Edition, it does not have elves. That's why it's this high. You know what you did. You never brought it out. Very upset. I kept waiting. I waited. I waited. I waited. I waited. And it ended up here, number 85. Still higher than Anthony, though. 2nd Edition. That is true. That is true. Uh -huh. Props to that. Um, number 84 for me is Shakespeare. Uh, this is a spectacular game in which you get to play... You're basically, you're putting on plays by Shakespeare. So you have uh -huh. actors playing different roles in his plays. You have people behind the stage, like seamstresses and people building the stages. Um, you have guards and extras. And then with the backstage expansion, you also have the people working backstage, like pulling the ropes and doing all that work. Um, the really cool thing about this is you bid for how many actions you're going to take every round. And the fewer mm -hmm. you bid, the sooner you go in turn order. So it's like this really push your luck uh, kind of a thing. Um, 
just a fantastic, relatively inexpensive, accessible, and not very long game. It's like an hour, hour and a half most. So well worth checking out if you haven't tried it yet. Shakespeare. Very cool. My number 84 game is Small City by Alvin Viard. We already talked about him in the beginning, and I'm guessing he's going to come out throughout. So Small City was one of those really interesting, unique games that I sat down at the table and thought I was going to run for the exit and found myself loving this game. Again, you're picking roles, you're building up your soul city, but that's not it. It's, this is not a kind of like, hey, I do my own thing and nothing else happens. In fact, you're building and you're traveling throughout. So, hey, your residents need to work. They have to work out of the places. They got to deal with some situations. So this is a great game. And it really just offers a different type of gameplay I haven't seen anywhere else. That's our number 84, Small City. All right. Number 83 for me, another Tom Lehman game. I didn't do that on purpose. It's funny. Um, wow. Apparently his games are very strong 80s. <laughs> uh, Res Arcana. This one came out a couple years ago. And it's a very, very small game. Like very limited number of cards. You, you're only going to play, I think, eight cards in the whole game. And you're trying to do the most you possibly can with this very strict limitations that they give you. So you're building your tableau, you're trying to take actions, you're trying to complete various obstacles and quests and whatever, and there's all these bonuses and things you can gain and an engine you can build with the cards you're pulling in and these other cards you pull down. Um, there are at least one expansion for this that I know of. I think there might be a second. I don't know if it's out yet. And yeah, it's just, it's one of those games that's quick and accessible and takes maybe 40 minutes to play. But there's so many decisions to be made within that limited time and limited amount of uh, materials that it's just jumped up on my list. So that's Res Arcana. My number 83 is Tokaido's Collector's Edition. Now, regular Tokaido is great. Tokaido's expansions are great. Put them all together and add a little paint, and you have Tokaido's Collector's Edition. So Takato's Collector's Edition is all about this wondrous journey from Tokyo to Edo. And you're just enjoying each and every step of the way. You are painting lavish paintings. You're meeting wondrous people. You're going to the hot springs. It's just really everything a journey can have. It is very much a Zen game. You really do feel like, I'm just enjoying the ride. This is cool. I take this or I don't take this. It doesn't matter. I'm just enjoying every step of the way. You pick up some food. You enjoy the ride. Again, the expansions add a little more complexity to the game. doesn't necessarily need it, but the Collector's Edition does a fantastic job of putting it all in one place. That's my number 83, Takedo's Collector's Edition. All right. 82. Whoop, I pressed the wrong button. <laughs> Going forward, not backward. Uh, Fleet the Dice Game at number 82. Uh, this is... So Fleet came out a while ago, and it was a decent game. I have a copy right here somewhere. I like it. Uh, but Fleet the Dice game is spectacularly good for a roll-and-write game because it takes what is generally a very simple mechanic and realistically only works as a filler type of mechanic most of the time. I know some people like the bigger, longer ones. I generally don't. But this one I do like. It's like 40, 45 minutes long. You have multiple sheets and different things you have to do. Um, and the combos carry across all these different possible actions you can take. It works. It feels like a complete game, and it feels like it has to be a roll and write, uh, which is the two things you don't always get in these. So it is sure. one of my favorite roll and writes for that reason. It was one of the better games that came out you know, last year, and I highly recommend it if you do like roll and writes. And if, even if you don't, I think you should try it if you're a fan of like medium heavier games because there is a lot here to think through. So let's fleet the dice game. My number 82 game is a game I never thought it would be up there. No. And it's just, again, a very interesting game. But nonetheless, Martin Wallace, it's a game about war. It's a game about war versus Cthulhu and the mm. Elder Gods. And it's a Euro game. It's Australia, but with a Z. So it's like Australia or something to that. So please forgive my pronouncing of that because it's insane. It's chaotic. But it's really a great game, and I can't believe there's actually war game mechanics in a Euro game about Cthulhu. But here it is. 
I don't know why, but it's here and it's great. And that's my number <laughs> two. <laughs> you need to grab some of that for the back of the box. A blur. <laughs> I just don't even know what it is, but it's so great. It's... <laughs> All right, number 81 for me is Iki, a game of Edo artisans. Um, I actually bought this game on credit from Chris because I didn't have any cash, and they were selling it at, at Gen Con, and uh, I really wanted it. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> it is a really good game, though. You have kind of a Rondell mechanic where you're moving through this market and taking various actions and leveling up these different artisans that you can then put into the market stalls, and then they can eventually retire, which is so nice. Like all these games about working, these people just work forever. But in this game, they can retire, and they're worth, and they're worth points if they retire to certain <laughs> levels. Um, the artwork you see on the cover is the artwork that is in the game. It is just a beautiful, beautiful game. It never got a wide release in the West. I think Board Game Geek has gotten copies in occasionally, and it stayed in print in Japan, I think. But it's it's one of those games I'm really, really happy to own and that I picked up when I did because I, I keep coming back to it, and I really do enjoy it. My number 181 game is a game Anthony already talked about, but I think it deserves to be a little bit higher. <laughs> and that's at the gates of Loyang. This is another <clears throat> Uwe Rosenberg game. Obviously, it's farming. Here, it's vegetable farming and selling in the market. Wondrous solo player. It's actually, in fact, my favorite Euro that, that does solo. I mean, I mm -hmm. love the solo version here. It's really fun. It's interesting. It's dynamic. It's challenging at all levels. And yet, at the same time, it's very simplistic and sleek. So my number 81, At the Gates of Loyang. I hear you. I hear you. It's It could be higher on mine, too. It's a good game. <laughs> All right. Number... You're not as you're not as big as a solo player. That's yeah, right. that's, that's got to be it, right? You're the solo <laughs> guy. Jason, you still in the chat? That's you want to call him on it? <laughs> um, number 80 for me is Heaven and Ale. This is a game by yes. Michael Kiesling and Andreas Schmidt. And in this game, you are moving around this board, stopping wherever you please. Uh, Takedo-style mechanic. You just go as far as you want. And then eventually you run out of actions you can take, and people can catch up to you. Um, but you're buying these different <laughs> tiles, and you're placing them either on the light side or dark side of your board. And that's going to give you either move you up certain tracks or get you some money that lets you do more actions. Money is super, super tight in this game. But the end goal is to increase the values of all the different things that go into the beer you're making. And at the mm -hmm. end, you want all of them be, to be communally as far as they can be, because that's how you're going to score. They're all going to consolidate at the end, and that's your score. So it doesn't matter how if one of them goes all the way to the end of the track, doesn't matter. Um, there's an expansion out for this as well, which adds like a cool little sideboard where you're like actually delivering the beer to different places along a route, which is very cool. Um, it's fun. I really like this a lot. It's very tight. It reminds me like Lorenzo and that, and just like all the actions you take are just like. Arr! If you make a wrong decision early, you're like, ah, yeah. <laughs> forget this game. Um, but Heaven and Ale, number 80 for me. My number 80 is Antiquity. So let's drop some splatter on the yeah. table and watch everybody run. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even the only splatter by a long shot. <laughs> so, you know, splatter is all about bringing really fantastic, crunchy, heavy, complex games to the table. And this happens to be one of the most complex, as Anthony mentioned, about having people work and then retire. Well, this has people work, retire, and then die. <laughs> and you have to actually manage the graveyard on top of everything else. What's really interesting about the game is it captures everything so very well about that time period, and not to mention all the pollution cities make back in that era so you do have a very competitive element as the board tends to shrink as everyone's after resources, but also <laughs> contaminating the lands and dealing with the population. So, yeah, my number 80, Antiquity. This is like severely lacking from my uh, splatter background. I've not played this one yet. Oh, I know. <laughs> great. Uh, number 79 for me is London. Um, this is a Martin Wallace game, and there is a second edition as well, which is it's spectacular. It's both of these games are very good. I think this game was on my top 100. Second edition came out also on my top 100. So pick or choose, right? Um, I think right now if you want to buy one, it's second edition. But this is a game in which you are building a tableau of cards. And similar to Antiquity, there's pollution. Um, you are going to run all these various different buildings or whatever in your tableau. And the number of slots you have is basically indefinite. You can keep building it out as long as you want, but each of them is going to produce that you know, you're going to have that negative victory points that they produce. 
sure. and so you have to manage that. So you can build on top to make it efficient, or you can build it very long horizontally and have all these different actions you can take when you run your city, but it's going to hurt you. So you have to have some kind of mechanisms in place to manage that and reduce it so you don't end the game with a bunch of negative points. Um, at the end of the day, it's it's a just a tableau builder, right? The second edition removed the board entirely uh, just to focus, you know, no map. You don't need a map, just the cards. So this is one of my favorite Martin Wallace games, and I'm really glad they brought it back a couple years ago. That's London. Yeah, still haven't played this yet. We're looking forward to it. Yeah, you'd like it. My number 79 is Everdell. Everdell is a wondrous worker placement game about these forest creatures who are building up their little city, and each of the woodland creatures has a occupation, and each of the buildings kind of works together with them, and it has the most overproduction of a board game I think there's ever been, <laughs> at least as far as the base game is concerned. And yet at the same time, it's lavish, it's lush, it's beautiful, it's gorgeous, it's got a giant cardboard tree, and, uh, you know, that's that's Everdell. That is my number 79. That is pretty much Everdell, yeah. <laughs> Uh, 78 for me is Anachrony. This is David Turchi working with Victor, Peter, and Richard Amon. Um, one of my favorite worker placement games all around. Big, sprawling thing of a game where you are traveling forward and backwards in time, trying to you pick up various things, but you have to pay yourself back so you don't create an anomaly. And ultimately, you're trying to honestly get the most victory points and get out before this new catastrophe happens at the end of the game. It is a worker placement game, but all the different layers of cool stuff added on top of it just create this big sprawling thing. I'm not very good at this game either. So uh, of all the worker placement games that I am good at, this is the one I seem to like the most, but it is fantastic. Anachrony. Nice. My number 78 game is Dynasties, Herat and Hirsch. Uh, again, forgive the pronouncing of those words, but nonetheless, it's a wondrous game from Matthias Kramer. I know that I got that right. And again, what's really interesting about this game is it's about different area control, but the area control is not done through war, but it's done through marriage. So again, a very different theme, a very different mechanic. You actually roll dice. You'll see about the dowry. You'll see how certain families get certain you know, resources and benefits. The other family, maybe not so much, but they do get something. So, again, a very different, very interesting, very dynamic game. One of my favorites out there, and again, hasn't really hit the U.S. yet. Hopefully it does, because I think this is something that really people will uh, enjoy. Yeah, yeah, it's weird it hasn't come over. It's very good. All right, so my turn to go higher on the list. Number 77, 878 Vikings. So <laughs> there you go. I love this game as well. Um, the Birth of America series is fantastic. This is even better than those, taking those mechanics and just doing more with them. It's more asymmetrical. It's more craziness. Um, throwing all the expansions and extra you know, <clears throat> leaders and stuff you can throw on top of it. It's just such a spectacular, very solid two-player game and uh, one of my favorites. So whatever Chris said, Plus all that, <laughs> number 77, 878 <laughs> Vikings. My number 77 game is a Game of Thrones, the card game, second edition. I mean, first edition is just as good in a lot of ways, but second edition actually offers you a lot more gameplay. Again, this could be just another typical LCG from Fantasy Flight. But again, what's really interesting about this game is that nothing is wasted. So typically when you take an IP and you build a game out of it, it's usually, hey, it's going to do this thing. So maybe it's war or maybe it's intrigue or maybe it's an economy or whatever it is. Game of Thrones is really all of those things. The whole song of ice and fire has all of these characters having really prominent roles, no matter if they're a warrior or someone in the political class or such. And in this LCG... All the characters here, all of their roles have that same sort of presence, thematic appeal, and thematic power in the game. So, a Game of Thrones, the card game, second, my number 77. All right, number 76 for me is Santorini. That's another one we've done on BGA Live recently. And it's yes. a abstract game in which you're building up these buildings. You're trying to stand on the highest building, so... You win by getting to the third level of any of these buildings, but other people can cap them with those blue domes. 
what makes a game really good though is you have all these asymmetrical god powers that basically each of them break yes. the rules in one separate way and there's dozens of them so there's all these different ways to play the game very fun very quick and easy to play the online implementation is fantastic highly recommended santorini My number 76 is Guilds of Caldewan. Now, this is a game from Cool Mini or Not back in the day when it was Cool Mini or Not, not Simon. Now, this game reminds me a little bit of Anthony's Spirium game. The whole idea was controlling these different areas by placing down your factions in order to gain the special abilities. It was light. It was fun. It really was dynamic. We play this a ton of times. The big box comes with a lot of extra stuff. Special abilities, area control, tableau building, Guilds of Caldewan, my number 76. That's a hidden gem. Um, mm -hmm. Next up for me, number 75, is First Class, All Aboard the Orient Express from Helmet Oli. Uh, this is the designer of Russian Railroads, which you've already talked about, and I will talk about later. Um, and <laughs> it's, it's like a lighter, quicker card version of that, and it is spectacularly good. The first time I played it, I was... I hadn't even played my copy yet. Someone else had brought it. And I was like, ooh, I own this. I want to learn it. And I played it. And I was like, oh, my gosh. I'm so glad I bought this. <laughs> I bought it because it was a Russian Railroads guy. I didn't know it was this good. It's, it's such a good game. And, uh, yeah, it, I wish I got to play it more. I wish I had, like, a good solo version that in the box that I could play with. But first class is just spectacular. Number 75. My number 75 is Terraforming Mars. This was a big game when it came out. Anthony and I picked up the first copies that were available, and it's gone on as one of the best games out there right now. The expansions have been hit and miss throughout, some better than others, some far worse than others. The rules have been a little bit all over the place, and the artwork has been up and down as, as well as the production. Right. That being said, it's such an extraordinary game that it really needs to be part of everyone's top 100. Tableau building area placement, resource gathering, really a fantastic game. Terraforming Mars, my number 75. All right. Number 74 for me is Railroad Revolution. Uh, this is a game from What's Your Game, and I purchased this way back when it was on pre-order, and then they sent it to me. It didn't have any of the tracks in the box. And so <laughs> when I asked them to send me the tracks, it took like six months to get them because they were shipping them from, I don't know, what Italy, Portugal. I don't remember exactly where they are, but... When I finally got a chance to play it several years later, I was like, wow, this is really good. I wish I'd played this <laughs> earlier. It's a really great game. And a lot of their games are very good, so I wasn't that surprised. Um, expansion recently came out as well. I haven't had a chance to play with that because I think that came in in this bubble of COVID. But um, just sure. one of those like hidden gems of a game that I don't think got nearly enough credit when it came out. Railroad Revolution. Yeah, this was in my top 100. It might be my number 101. Mm. Just not getting the expansion to the table probably kept it just out of the list. Sure. My number 74 is a game that Anthony and I had an opportunity to play at PAX Unplugged a couple of years back. This was from a first-time creator, Obsession. Pride, intrigue, prejudice, all those fun things. Upstairs, downstairs, Downton Abbey, in a board game. Yeah. So... Again, super thematic. You are running your family. You're running this manor. You're putting on all these wondrous events in order to gain reputation. And yet at the same time, you're dealing with all the ins and out of the social drama that goes on. This is a great game. Recently had a second edition, a reprint that came up there. Some corrections to the rules that make the game so much better. Obsession, my number 74. All right, I'll talk about that one a little bit as well. Uh, number 73 for me is the Manhattan Project Energy Empire. This is designed by Luke Laurie and Tom Jolly. And this is one of those games where you're just like, I don't even know what they were doing with the name because you see Manhattan Project, you assume it's a sequel to Manhattan Project. It's got nothing to do with Manhattan yes. Project. Other than the fact that you're like producing energy. Um, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a very, very good game, though. You are building out a tableau and taking actions based on these dice that you basically try to build up based on other actions that you're taking. You have these limited pool of workers, and they are the cool little Manhattan Project workers, which I do like. Um, it's one of those games that super, super fell under the radar. Maybe maybe not if you listen to us, because we both do like this game quite a bit. But, it, mm -hmm. yeah, if you have not played this yet and you like worker placement, if you like tableau building, if you like any type of medium weight hero, you should check this out. Yep, it's higher on my list as well. 
My number 73 is a game that came out quite some time ago, had a really odd start. It had these really nice, big, beautiful, chunky dice that had some really weird, sticky, oily problems with oh, them, yeah. and it kind of set the game back a bit. Yeah. That being said, Quantum, what a great game. The idea of abstracting these 4X space battles, this wonderful artwork, and this kind of unique gameplay where the whole universe is modular. So you can kind of move the tiles around. You can upgrade your ships. Again, lots of ways to win this game. A lot of fun. This is on Board Game Arena. Highly recommended. You probably haven't played it, but you absolutely should. That's now my number 73, Quantum. Yeah, forgot about Quantum. Very good. Yep. All right, number 72 for me is Stefan Reisthaus's Arkwright. This is a beast of an economic game. <laughs> um <laughs> It's just, it's funny. Like most people know this as one of the games that uh, City of the Big Shoulders draws its um, some of its mechanics from. It is a lot more than that. It is a big, massive, long economic Euro game with one sole focus to end the game with the most money. But you do that through both acquiring cash and increasing the value of your stock as high as you can, and having obviously the mm -hmm. shares in that stock that you pull out. Um, the games can take, there's two different versions of the game. You have like a short version and a long version. Short version is like two to three hours. Long version is like four to six hours. It's a long game, but it is well worth it if you like economic euros. It's just such a heavy, heavy fun, for me, heavy fun game. I, not everybody I've played with had as much fun as I do, but I do like this game a lot. And it's arc rate. I still haven't played this yet. Every time it almost gets to the table, everyone's like, oh no, yeah. that's too long. <laughs> you got to plan a day for it. It's not <laughs> something you just throw on the table. Sure. My number 72 is San Juan 2nd Edition. 1st Edition works just as well. 1st Edition, in fact, had been out of print for so long that when it finally came back out, I think it sold out almost immediately. Mm -hmm. This was a game that was a grail game for a long time. One of the most innovative games, honestly, that I've ever seen. Again, this is the same mechanic that you see in Race for the Galaxy, the idea that your cards are your money but they're also your building. So there is a double kind of trap here as far as you're sacrificing to build up San Juan. You're building up everything as far as the different fields are concerned, the city buildings. This is the typically considered the card version of Puerto Rico, but I think this is the far superior version. It's a lot of fun, and it's a great game. First edition, second edition, you're going to do great. San Juan, my number 72. Number 71 for me is... Civilization A New Dawn, um, despite the mm -hmm. world's worst demo that we've ever had. Um, <laughs> I bought this anyways, and I do like it quite a bit. Uh, it's just a very quick, accessible, uh, very clever um, action selection mechanic for a civilization game. The base game is missing some of the basic core <laughs> mechanisms of a civilization game, um, but the expansion does layer those in um, quite nicely. And now there's an official solo version that they've released as well. The combination of the expansion and the solo version, especially during COVID, pushed this into my top 100. I've always really liked this and championed it, but it was hard to get it to the table. I feel like it'll be a little easier now because the game is so much better with that extra stuff. Still have not played this game beyond the demo, so I'll have to take your word for it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's worth trying now. I don't know that I would have pushed it on you before. But... <laughs> My number 71 game is a, another surprising game. It's two players, but maybe not should be so much a surprise. It's Matthias Kramer. Right. It's Watergate. It's a two-player game that really is so deep and thematic as you are playing kind of asymmetrical competitive forces, whether you're the president or the journalist. It is... Abstract enough that you don't need to know the history. The history doesn't play that much into it, but still so much fun. Mm -hmm. So incredibly fun. Who knew? I know. <laughs> <laughs> that be <laughs> that this would be this much fun. So absolutely positively check it out. Number 71, Watergate, not to be missed. Yeah, way higher on my list. We'll talk about it more in a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I agree. So, All right, so next up on my list at number 70, is the next Albin VR game. It's the third one if you're keeping track. Um, Tramways. Go. So Tramways is uh, it's a deck building game, but it's also a route building game mm -hmm. and a pick up and deliver game. So you're kind of jamming a whole bunch of different stuff here together. You are 
you have a, you start the game with a hand of cards or a deck of cards, and each of these cards has all these different symbols on it, and you use those symbols to do various different things, like the leisure buildings, the residential buildings, the commercial buildings. They're represented on the cards, as long as as well as the symbols for the mm-hmm. actions you're going to take. So, the deck building mechanic is very engaging and clever, and has an auction built in in terms of like what cards you're going to take. Um, he's layered all sorts of mechanics on top of this, and now he's released I think 15 or 16 maps for this as well. Um, wow. I've collected them vigorously because I know his stuff goes out of print, even though I've only played like three of them. But Tramways is one of those games that it's ugly as sin, but it's absolutely spectacular. I hope it gets the Eno Tool treatment someday, um, so more people look take a look at it. Yeah, I only got to play this once. I really enjoyed it. I I assume that if I would have played it more, it would have made it higher on my list. My number seventy game is Scoville. Again, another really interesting thing that you don't think that you're going to see in board gaming, all about these wondrous hot peppers. So you are going to go through each step of the way of planting, and the the planting option here is really interesting and innovative because it is a really kind of interesting tactical movement game in order to locate the best fields. Then, obviously, you've got a whole situation where you're trying to pick up the biggest peppers. So... Throughout this game, it utilizes different mechanics to demonstrate and facilitate the idea of what it must be like to be a farmer and getting these super, super hot peppers to market. Really great game. Fun, colorful. Just such a different game. My number 70, Scoville. All right. Number 69 for me is the Castles of Burgundy, the card game. Um, We have yet another Gen Con story of chasing games down here. (laughs) Chris... (laughs) Uh, Chris, like, waiting by the uh, stand to get him. Um, this is a card version, card game version of Castles of Burgundy, and it uses solely cards. There's nothing else in the game. It y- takes up about as much space as the original game on the table, but it fits in this tiny little tuck box. It's quick. It's accessible. It's not exactly the same game. It is legitimately its own thing. It's worth owning. I do own it and play it, you know, in rotation with the other one. Uh, that's Castles of Burgundy, the card game. All right, it's higher on my list, and I'll tell my story then. (laughs) My number 69 game is Orleans Deluxe Edition. The standard version works as well, but Orleans does need its expansions in order to be a great game. Now, Orleans is all about bag building. So you are, you know, seeking out all your citizenry to come out and help you farm to protect, whether it's knights, whether it's scholars. Again, its expansions really open this game up greatly. It has a board mechanic where you search around to gain additional resources and you're trading throughout. It deals with kind of like global tragedies that are happening. Really, Orleans, wondrous game, definitely deserves to be on your list, on my list for number 69. All right, number 68 for me is Council of Four. It's another Simone Luciani and Daniel Tashini game. Uh, this is the Simon version. I have the original cranio version which i like way better but it is kind of boring to look at um this one is so overproduced um it's got miniatures for no reason (laughs) it's it's a whole thing uh but they're both identical in terms of gameplay so if you're gonna play it play either they're both fantastic it's got a ticket to ride mechanic with the cards and then you're placing your buildings based on the cards that you play out but every time you place a building down you get to activate everything that's connected to that including that city so there's bonuses in every city if you complete a chain and you don't separate things out as you build them, you're getting all sorts of bonus and extra stuff, which is fantastic. So it's just one of those like deeply satisfying games to play because every time you do something, you get a bunch of stuff, which is fun. Um, that's uh, Council of Four. I think it, it has miniatures for no reason. Should be a, your review of the game on the back of the box. <laughs> <laughs> it's so... Uh, yeah, don't get me started. It's so nonsensical what they did with I this. Guess. My number 68 game is Madeira Collector's Edition. Now, the regular edition is just fine, but the Collector's Edition does bring in the parts that have been out of print for so very long and do add so much replayability to the game. So, again, we are dealing with pirates, we're dealing with trading, we're dealing with interesting, unique ports of trade. And, again, it really hits so many things right. As you mentioned earlier, again, Anthony, What's Your Game does such a great job 
We are still waiting for this game. It's somewhere in port if it hasn't been taken by pirates. We hope <laughs> to one day soon see the Madeira's Collector's Edition. Although the base game with the expansion is still very good. Very excited for this, but I still didn't play the original. So I'm going off your oh, review for this one. <laughs> such a good game. I know, it looks good. All right, and my number 67 is Fields of Arl. This is uh, Uwe Rosenberg. This is his big, big sandbox two-player game. Um and it's mm -hmm. like the sandbox of sandboxes. Like I know we we'll talk about a feast for Odin later. That's a big sandbox of a game too. But this one is a little bit more even, although it does limit you mm -hmm. in terms of the actions you take because you have the different seasons and the actions correlate to the seasons. You can only take certain actions at certain times of the year. Um, but it is just if you want a big, long, heavy two-player Euro, this is it. Like a lot of the other games have two-player versions and they're fine to okay. This one is built for two. The expansion brings it up to three. Still very good. Or you can play with two and just add the T and trade bits. Um, Fields of Arl is fantastic. Solo is also very good. So this is, uh, yeah, my number 67. My number 67 is Macau. Or soon to be reprinted in, in Feld's new city edition. But until that comes out and we get to change that up to this... Macau is still a wondrous game from Stefan Feld. And it's a, one of those Feld gems that because it went out of print so early on that many people didn't play it, I got a chance to play it. And I'm still very, very much interested in playing the future. And that's why I backed a ridiculously high campaign <laughs> because Macau and its mechanics were so wonderful that I wanted to get back to the table again. That's my number 67, Macau, or soon to be new version coming soon to a, a game table near you hopefully yeah i want to play this too hopefully <laughs> all right number 66 for me is king of tokyo this is richard garfield's yahtzee with monsters um i don't know if there's much more to say about it than that it's yahtzee with monsters it's awesome you get some power-up cards you get to some special abilities but honestly this is one of the best family games i own like super super good king of tokyo <laughs> yeah Absolutely. I think uh, my King of New York almost made it onto the list. It, it was it was a holdout. My number 66 is Smartphone Inc. Again, another great game that we played at PAX Unplugged a couple of years back. It had a great Kickstarter that upgraded almost everything. Hasn't hit my table yet. If and when it does, it'll probably go much higher. But again, a game that looks like not so much really is a great game. And it's innovative mechanic of how you choose actions by layering tiles on top of each other. Seriously, who knew it would be that good? That is my number 66, Smartphone Inc. Yeah, we we'll talk about that a little bit more soon. Mm -hmm. All right, number 65 for me is The Lord of the Rings Journeys in Middle Earth. Uh, this is a Lord of the Rings game, obviously, from Fantasy Flight that mashes up like the Mansions of Madness and Descent mechanics. So you've got like this big sprawling world where you're laying tiles and going on adventures. And then you have an app that's kind of guiding you and throwing things out there. Um, so you have to be okay with the app. A lot of people are not, it's fine. I personally don't have a problem with it and I very much enjoy this game. My son loves it. We have played through all the adventures now at this point. Um, it is probably my favorite of those big box things because I've played it the most and it's the most accessible and there are no dice, just cards. So I love it. Um, that is my number 65, Journeys in Middle Earth. Nice. Still haven't played this yet. Looking forward to it. My number 65 is The Quacks of Quinlanburg. The Quacks is a great game I played a while back when it was in its earliest forms. And North Star Games did a great job. This is a very affordable, very fun, very colorful, press-your-luck game with bag building. Bag building is so much fun because there's almost infinite replayability because you decide how you build your bag up in order to build up these wondrous potions. It's got a new expansion and a recent expansion that came out. All of them are great. This game is fantastic fun. You could play with family, play it a little bit low level, or go hardcore with gamers. And again, if for no other reason, everyone's paying a ridiculous amount of money for the upgraded pieces, it should just give you an idea of how great Quacks of Klinberg really is. My number 65. Number 64 for me, another Tan Daniel Tashini game. You should uh, <laughs> notice a trend here. Uh, Zulkin the Mayan Calendar. This is the one with the big wheels where you put your worker on the wheel and the wheel turns every round and then the wheel the workers become more powerful and then eventually you take the wheel workers off and you take that action. 
Um, you're moving up temple tracks, you're building stuff, you're building monuments. You, you know the deal. Um, <laughs> we're actually going to be playing this this week on BGA Live. So if you have never seen Zulk in the Mayan calendar um, or want to learn more about it, make sure you tune in and we'll we'll walk you through it and show you how it works. Yep. It'll be live this Wednesday. All right. My number 64 is Panamax. Again, this is another game that I always thought that eh, it looks a little slow. It looks a little tired. It looks a little too overwrought. And yet when you play it, the idea of moving these ships through the canal and how you kind of line up, how you push other people through, what kind of special abilities you pick up, how you're able to hit certain markets really is such a dynamic game. Again, you would not think so, but it's <laughs> thematic throughout and really fun throughout. And after I was done playing, I was like, I want to play this a game. This was really a, uh, a, a great game out there. So that's my number 64, Panamax. Yeah, this is one of those ones I, I have not played yet. I need to do that. It's a great game, yeah. All right, number 63 for me is Forbidden Stars. This is the um, the remake of uh, StarCraft, the board game, which has been out of print forever. And this is now out of print forever as well uh, because it's a Warhammer license. But I finally got a chance to play it at a friend's house. I do have a copy as well. And it is fantastic. It is this really cool mechanic in terms of like where you're placing your discs on the board to determine where you're going to take actions. But it's hidden and people can place on top of you. And so like how things resolve, the order in which they resolve and where they resolve is super important because you're going to place them all out and then you choose when to remove it and act it, act on it. And you have to remember where it is though. <laughs> like, so it's like a memory game mixed in there as well. Um, for a game, that's like Warhammer 40 K. You think it's going to be all about miniatures and big explosions and stuff. It's like, sure. it's really not. There are obviously those mechanics in there, but it has a lot of Euroness to it. It's, it's very good. I highly recommend it if you get a chance to play it. Forbidden Stars. Still haven't played this. Obviously out of print. Really sad about that. All right. My number 63 is Marco Polo 2 in the service of the con. Now, maybe, possibly, Marco Polo's a little bit higher on my list. But Marco (laughs) Polo 2 does a really great job of expanding the idea of Marco Polo's travels throughout Asia and really add some interesting and dynamic gameplay. So not a radical departure from Marco Polo, but a really fun departure. So a lot more characters, a lot more things to do, and a lot easier to travel. So yeah. Marco Polo 2, in the service of the con. I have a feeling this will be on my list eventually, but I still haven't played it enough. Okay. All right. We talked about Marvel Champions last year, and we are like, will this be on my list? And guess what it is? So this is number 62. Um, This is the first of the LCGs I want to talk about. This one kind of takes the core mechanics of Lord of the Rings and Arkham and focuses on the combat. And it's really good in doing that. Um, They didn't really have any story content until very recently. But they have all the different heroes now. Obviously not all of them, but a lot of them. And they're going to keep releasing them about once every month or so. And I every time a new one comes out, I sit down and play it and I run through it put it against all these different uh, villains and then their decks. And I don't know, man, it's just, it's got its hooks in me. I didn't think it would at first, just based on the type of game it is. And honestly, when they announced it, I, I thought it sure. was a cash in and it, it probably still is, but it's a very good game that I enjoy quite a bit. So that's Marvel champions. My number 62 is Lorenzo Imanifico. This was a wonderful tableau builder, you're choosing cards from the market. You're picking all these artisans to kind of help you build up, get you resources throughout the game. This was fun, crunchy from two of our favorite designers out there. And yet at the same time, it can be played with pretty much everybody. Again, the expansion really complexes a little too, too much for the general fan. But again, you're just picking up cards and you're building up your tableau. And there's a different way to build it up each and every time. That's my number 62, Lorenzo Amenifico. All right. Number 61 for me is Seven Wonders. This is Mm -hmm. the ultimate drafting game. That's all I got to say about it, right? It's Seven Wonders. I don't know. (laughs) If you're you're watching or listening to this, you know what Seven Wonders is. (laughs) Um, I haven't played the second edition yet with all the new stuff. Maybe once on BGA, but... um, I don't, I don't know what changes have been made, but I do have the original and I have several of the expansions and I really enjoy it. 
it's uh, if yeah, I don't know. I don't know what what else there is to say honestly about Seven Wonders, and I'm sure Chris will elaborate <laughs> more eloquently later. But this is my number sixty one. It's possible this is higher on my list. Imagine. Just just possible. <laughs> my number sixty one is Fresco, the Mega Box. Now again, you don't need the Mega Box, but nonetheless, it's a Mega Box, and it's got a really mega picture on it. So. The Mega Box was a recent Kickstarter that came out. It had all of the additional, you know, pieces that you can play, all the queenies, all their additional modules concerned. The idea is that you are getting your crew up to paint the fresco. And again, very thematic. When do you wake everybody up? When do you get your artisans to the markets to pick up paint? How do you go about, you know, mixing those paints, adding the gold leaf, doing all those really fun things? Uh, Queen Games has done a great job here. This is a beautiful game to get to the table. Again, all the paints, all the colors, all the frescoes, things that are out there. Really a wonderful game. That is Fresco, the Mega Box, or any other big box, or just Fresco. <laughs> all the things, whatever. It doesn't matter. <laughs> all the things. All right, number 60 for me is Star Wars Imperial Assault. So uh, this one still edges out Journeys in Middle Earth on the list even though i don't play it nearly as often because it's star <clears throat> wars and i have all of the things for it so i guess in this case the amount of money spent helped um push it higher on the list <laughs> it is also a very good game it does come with like two versions of the game you have like the overlord style where you're playing one versus many or you can play one-on-one -on -one in skirmish mode or there's an app where you can play without the overlord and the app takes care of that so if you have all the content for it, there's a lot of ways to play this game. And mm -hmm. it goes through all these different arcs and all the different locations that you know and love from the original trilogy and some from some of the cartoons as well. Um, none of the new trilogy and none of the prequels. So none of the stuff people have problems with, I guess. But uh, yeah, Star Wars Imperial Assault is... I don't, I don't know if it's quite out of print yet, but they're not making it anymore. So if you're interested, make sure you track it down while you can. Yeah, this is another one of those games I just never got to the table, don't know why, never got a chance to pick it up. It just, again, it seems like a massive, massive game, but it looks great. Yeah. My number 60 game is Gents Deluxified Edition. This game was one that I had seen on Kickstarter and completely avoided because it seems so basic, right? The idea of, of these, you know, the ancient civilization being built up, Looked very simple. The reprint here looked better. But again, it was really hard for the Kickstarter to depict what this game was all about. So again, if you're building up your civilization, it's going to take time. And really, time is the main mechanic here, the main resource here. And again, it just blew me away the first time I played it. I picked it up immediately. I still don't have the deluxe version. And even though I have the base game, I still want the deluxe version Really a fantastic game. Definitely something to check out. Uh, Gentes, the Deluxified Edition. Highly recommend. All right, number 59 for me is a super tiny little baby game. Um, <laughs> Sprawlopolis. Aww. It's it's a wallet game from Button Shy Games, and this is probably the one that put them on the map, despite the fact they released like 50 of these things, because um, it is their big hit so far. You have 18 cards. Two of them have scoring things on them you're trying to do and the rest of them you just flip over and they look exactly like that cover there uh and you try to match them up and you're trying to get the roads to match up you're trying to get the different types of um sectors to match up and at the end try to score positive points because frequently i'll end this game with negative points it is that difficult so um Spiralopolis is great it takes like five minutes ten minutes to play it's perfect solo i mean it's designed solo but there is a co-op version where you can go back and forth highly highly recommend it if you want something to throw in your bag for anything anytime you're leaving the house so sprawl opolis is number 59 for me never played this never played any of the games unfortunately hopefully one day my number 59 is kalamala uh this was a really interesting game that i love the mechanic that allows you to do pretty much everything in the game so you get a decision as far as where you're playing your people out there. And here, obviously, is a special situation because you're dealing with all of these artisans and craftspeople out there. Mm -hmm. So you place down your worker, and then you get the corresponding resources from both the horizontal and the vertical. And other people can do the same. But 
the more an action's taken, the more it builds up. And then there's a, a kind of like an explosion opportunity to actually gain some legal and some political support and some also trading that goes out there. This is a little known game, but really has a lot of punch to it. And it's one of my favorites, Kalamala. All right. Number 59. Number 58 for me. Uh, my turn to put a big box up here. Uh, the Battle of Five Armies. This Ooh. is super duper out of print. Um, they, they released it way back in the day when the Hobbit movies were coming out. And yeah. they didn't really do a second print run of it, or at least not not any runs recently. It's hard to find. Um, but I do have a copy, and it is the Hobbit version of War of the Ring. The mechanics are slightly different. Mm. It's more tactical. The map is more condensed. Um, it is very much combat focused, so there's not like that hidden movement element that you have in the original, because this is about this big battle, right? Uh, it's not quite as good as War of the Ring. Uh, we'll talk about that later, but it is still a very good, interesting spin on those mechanics. And if you know somebody who has it, or if they ever reprint it, I do highly recommend getting a play of it in, even if you've already played War of the Ring and have an opinion on it, because this is different, it's shorter, it's a little bit simpler, not a lot, but enough, and it is more tactical. So you don't have to think so far ahead as you do in War of the Ring. Yeah, this would be on my list as well. Again, it was one of those like in 105, but there is another game very similar to it that's a little bit higher on my list. Okay. My number 58 is On Mars. Mm-hmm. Uh, Vitello Serta's Wondrous Space Game. Obviously, this was something I backed on Kickstarter almost immediately. I played it at PAX Unplugged. It is a really, really wondrous game. Ian O'Toole artwork here. Just everything about this game really flows. Again, thematic appeal as far as moving back and forth from Earth to Mars and trying to make the most of your travels. This probably would be higher, but, you know, a little global t- catastrophe kind of kept it from hitting the table. Uh, that's my number 58 on Mars. All right. Number 57 for me is Carpe Diem. This is a Stefan Feld game, a recent one. Uh Mm-hmm. It's probably his highest ranked game that's come out in the last five years for me. And it didn't really hit home right away the first time I played it. But the more I play it, the more I get into it. Um, you are basically moving around this uh, rondelle and choosing these tiles that you place on your personal tableau. And you're trying to build buildings with it. So you have like different types of goods you can grow, like grapes or wheat or whatever. Um and then certain types of buildings you can create as well. And they're just like these little squares. They're not polyominoes, but you place them down on the grid and they help kind of build out this sprawling thing. And each different type of building or good that you produce will do something different. The goods you produce, you can trade in later. The scoring mechanics really unique and different because there's a limited number of options and the cards are random that go out. And once you place a disc down, you're the only one who could score that combination. But if you can't do a thing, you get negative points. It's very good. It's very quick. It's accessible. It's not quite the point salad craziness of his normal games. Um, I think it's one of his better lighter games. So that's Carpe Diem. My number 57 game is a game that came out quite some time ago. doesn't get a lot of love. deserves all the love. It's Vladimir Suchi's Last Will. Mm. This is often referred to as Brewster's Millions in a board game. But I think Brewster's Millions is such an old movie at this point. I think it's early 80s that no one's going to really get that reference. (laughs) But the idea here is you're really well-to-do. You're rich. You have everything that you could possibly want. And now you want to get rid of all of it. So it is your last will. So here you're building up all of your resources. You're doing wacky things like bringing your horse to a fine dining establishment. And then you're breaking down and selling off all of your real estate and everything else that goes along with it. This is one of the most challenging <clears throat> board games that are out there because you're used to building up your engine, but you're not used to building up your engine so much in order to burn it down as quickly as possible. Right. <laughs> I guarantee you this is going to throw you, but it's such a great game. That's my number 57, Last Will. Yeah, yeah, this is such a clever game. Um, 56 for me is another splatter game, Roads in Boats. This is like the ultimate pickup and deliver game. And it's a big sprawling map. And there basically are no rules. I mean, they're rules, but (laughs) (laughs) the first time we played it, one of us hadn't read the rules. And we're just like, let's just start. We'll figure it out as we go. And it was fine. I don't remember if they won, but they did fine. (laughs) um, you're, You're trying to 
I mean, you're picking up goods, you're delivering them, you're increasing their value. You don't really own very much on the board, though, so anybody can come and use those buildings that you put out. Um, you do draw on the board with marker, which is cool. Um, there's, like, an overlay mm -hmm. that goes over it, like, the, the roads and the various things you put in. Um, but at the end of the day, you're just trying to build the most efficient chain and make sure that you're the one who can access the different pieces of it. And that's just pretty cool. So it scales really well. The solo version of it is actually very solid. And the expansion that comes in the box, the 20th of it, 20th anniversary edition that I got has all sorts of extra stuff in it that I haven't really gotten to yet. But I was surprised I liked it so much because I'm not a huge fan of pick up and deliver. So that is Roads and Boats. All right. Yeah, even from the, the uh, board art, it makes it look like it's made up. So yeah, yeah I can see that. Yeah, it's a crayon. My number 56 game is another Vladimir Suchi. Hold on, hold on, mm -hmm. get used to it. It is the Prodigals Club. The Prodigals Club is the last will, but it's take on society. So maybe you've given up all your wealth, but how about your political status? How about your societal status? How about just throwing everything out the window? What's great about this game, obviously, is you can tie this together with Last Will, and each of the components are even better. It's hard to know which one is better, the Prodigals Club or Last Will, both great games. The Prodigals Club is probably just a smidge bigger, just a smidge better. It's really a great game. So if you haven't played Last Will, or even if you have, check out the Prodigals Club. Great game. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Both of these are awesome. Um, 55 for me, you already talked about, is Obsession. Pride, intrigue, and prejudice in Victorian England. Uh, I really didn't think I would like this game. And I think the first half of this game, when we played it at PAX, I hated it because I was getting crushed. Um, <laughs> and I was just like, you can't come back. This is garbage. And then I did come back. I didn't win, but I came back enough that I wasn't mad anymore. <laughs> so um, It's very good. I, pecked, I backed the new Kickstarter as well, so I have all the new content. I have not had a chance to play it yet, but I do like this quite a bit and... I'm excited to play it more once I get out of the house in the future. Uh, but Obsession is fantastic. It's my number 55. Absolutely. My number 55 is very close to Obsession, but radically different. It's, it's <laughs> Dinosaur Island. <laughs> so Dinosaur Island is Jurassic Park in a box. I have my friend Ryan from the whole card to thank for this. I did not back this. It looked absurd. Mm -hmm. Played it. It is absurd, mm -hmm. but honestly, in the best way possible. We already talked about how Everdell was way overproduced, but man, hold my beer. Here's Dinosaur <laughs> Island for you. Yeah. So you get a slap bracelet as the first player marker. You get all the colors of the game. What's really brilliant about this game is it is so easy to teach. Not that it's an easy game, but the game kind of breaks down to different areas and different boards. So everyone follows along. Great components. You are growing dinosaurs out of amber, and they're doing things in park, including eating people. So how could you not like this game? It's fantastic. It's my number 55, Dinosaur Island. Yeah, this is like 101, 102 for me. It's very close. It's very good, though. Uh, number 53, or 54, sorry, uh, Concordia. This is uh, Mac Gertz's most famous game with the most content added to it. Of all these maps, so many maps, maps coming out of everywhere. Um, I'm not going to go super in-depth on this because I know it's higher on your list. I just know. I haven't even looked at the list yet. I just know it's up there higher. Um, but it is a very solid, just fantastic game. I wish there was a better <laughs> online implementation. I'm glad they're making an app. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> That's Concordia, number 54 for me. It's higher on my list. Yeah, I know. My <laughs> number 54 is Cyclades. Now, Cyclades was one of the first Euro games slash Amerithrash game slash gods, monsters, and dudes on the map that was all about these Greek islands. The production here, especially back in the day, was so fantastic. On top of which, the gods and praying gods in order to be able to do anything was such a different mechanic. It's a bidding game. You have to bid in order to do anything. So again... You pray to the gods, you hopefully win their favor in order to do a number of things. The Hades expansion makes this game so much better. The Titans expansion changes it up a lot. It's its own game. But no matter which way you go, uh, Bruno Cathala, what a great game. Cyclades, my number 54. All right, number 53 for me is Caverna the Cave Farmers. 
This is the game that made me realize that I do, in fact, like Uwe Rosenberg's big sprawling uh, worker placement games. Uh, the first one I played was Agricola. wasn't a huge fan. Um, Caverna was billed as the sequel to Agricola. <laughs> and I was like, ah, sequel to Agricola. I don't know. But then once I played it, I was like, oh, this is amazing. I love this. This is fine. <laughs> Big, big, sprawling worker placement options. Um, tons of these buildings you can put in your cave to do all these various things. You have the inside of the cave, the outside of the cave. Um, so many paths to victory here and how you want to play it. And the solo version is pretty good if you feel like setting all that stuff up. Um, expansion for this is fantastic too. Adds the asymmetrical powers. Caverna, the Cave Farmers, is my number 53. My number 53 is a game I almost guarantee you've never played because it's... <laughs> Went out of print so quick. Uh, this is Cuba. And Cuba also has a great expansion. And it has a number of games in the kind of Cuba thematical world. Again, it's a great Euro game. It's all about producing and growing different resources, trading in different markets. And then a really innovative kind of like voting situation that's going to determine how those products get sold, what cost they get sold out, these different laws that come into play, and just like all the different elements. I picked this up at an auction, and I've been thrilled ever since. Got the expansion. Hopefully this gets reprinted someday. Cuba, my number 53. All right. My number 52 is not that. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. We'll have to go back a little. <laughs> uh, my number 52 is Nemo's War. Nemo's War is... A solo-only game. I think they added a cooperative version in the Kickstarter, but it's really designed as a solo game um, from Victory Point Games. And this was like one of the first big productions Victory Point did. And it is big. It's sprawling. You are going... You are Nemo in 20,000 Leagues Under the City. You are trying to sink these various ships. You're going on these adventures. You're trying to find treasure. You're doing all these different types of things. And at the end of the day, you're trying to balance all of that without having the ocean overrun with ships trying to catch you <laughs> there's a lot of ways to lose very few ways to win typical from a from a kind of solo slash cooperative type of game um have had a chance to play it several times now lots of little expansion pieces that come with it as well very 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 good had a lot of fun with this if you like solo games you should play nemo's war number 52 my number 52 is yet another splatter it's fuche magnet now, again, this is a great game. It's a Euro game. It's a heavy game. It's a game that scares some people away because when you're playing Fuche Magnet, you are playing an economic game on the next level. Don't give me these 18 double X games. Give me a game where you have spent your life building up your small local restaurant. Your family works there. You produce some amazing pizza and some local lemonade. And then Starbucks moves in and just crushes you. <laughs> and then you have to spend the next three hours watching your dwindling family fortune go down to nothing. This is such a thematic, wonderful game. You could take a look at the box cover. It really is a throwback to the 50s in every way possible. The expansion makes this game phenomenal. I highly recommend the expansion with the game. Especially when the game itself is as punishing as it is. That's my number 52 game, Fuche Magnet. <laughs> That's all accurate. Oh, man. Uh, 51 <laughs> for me, because I'll talk about Fuche Magnet more later. Uh, number 51 is Stuffed Fables. This is a game by Jerry Hawthorne of My Mystics fame. And it's the first of those adventure book games where you actually play on the pages of the book as you sort through it. You are these stuffed animals going on this adventure for their owner. It's such a cute, fun game. It's got some scary stuff in it, but not so scary the kids can't handle it. They love this. The dice allocation and the management of the dice in the actions that you're taking um, are just so much fun. I wish they would release more content for this. Maybe it just didn't do as well as they wanted, or Asmodee happened. Who knows? But Stuffed Fables <laughs> is uh, a spectacular game. It's up there on the shelf with Mice and Mystics for me. Um, number 51. Never got a chance to play this. Asthma Day happened. It just never got to the table. Right. But, you know, there's a Mice and Mystics out there for me somewhere. <laughs> My number 51 is, again, a reversion, a remaster I would, I would uh, attend. Um, Brass Birmingham. Brass was a game that I played a long time ago. Thanks, Dave. And I was like, oh, okay. Do I ever have to play this again? Because I'd rather not. And then this got reprinted. 
And Brass Lancashire is great. But Brass Birmingham is fantastic. It really is a great game. Again, it looks like a game like you would kind of pass along, but the card play here and the different actions you're able to take and how you're building up these networks yet again, whew, this is really, really a solid game. I just cringe every day that I didn't back the Kickstarter and I'm never going to forgive myself. Brass Birmingham, number 51, with all of its great stuff, especially those iron clay chips. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very pretty. Okay, uh, number 50 for me is uh, City of the Big Shoulders. This was my game of the year last year. And this is the game I was talking about, where you're mashing up stuff from Arkwright and 18xx, and it's got some worker placement mechanics mixed in there. Um, this one's on Board Game Arena right now, actually. You can play it in beta. It's a little buggy, but it, it works pretty well. We've played several games through as a part of our 10x10, and it's it's a lot of fun. Um, I, I think the rulebook has some issues that they're going to work on in the next edition, but if you can learn it, watch a video, get through it, and play a couple times, it's just takes all the things that I love about those other types of games and makes it more accessible and um, palatable for some people who <laughs> don't necessarily always like want to play an 18xx. Yeah, this was in my top 100, but the rulebook did pump it out yeah. just a little bit. I can see that. My number 50 is the Castles of Burgundy, the card game. Anthony already talked about this great game. And again, I'll tell my little quick story here. We were at Gen Con. And it was our one free hour before anything opened. And love, love Stefan Feld. Love the Castles of Burgundy. A card game version of this? Of all the games in the world to go stand outside and wait in line and, and sacrifice my one hour? Yep. It was the Castles of Burgundy, the card game. Which I did not get at that convention because they had so few copies that I couldn't get one. Nonetheless, it turned out to be a fantastic game. Got a chance to play with my friend Jay, who picked up a copy. Super quick, super fast. And in my book, it's far superior to the board game version. Mm -hmm. I know that's heresy here, but I do love this game so very much. And that's my number 50, The Castles of Burgundy, the card game. All right. Uh, number 49 for me, you just talked about it, Food Chain Magnet. Um, this is mm -hmm. the first splatter game I played. And my first play of this was brutal. I was so angry. <laughs> <laughs> and then I knew what a splatter game was. Um, but I went home and I thought about the game more than I typically think about any game after I lose. And I knew I had to play it again, and then I played it again, and I lost again, and I played it again, and I lost again. And I, played. I, think, I think the first time I actually won this game was like play 10-ish? It took a while. Um, but once you wrap your head around it, even before then, it's just such a spectacularly fun uh, puzzle to try to figure out with everybody else trying to mess up your puzzle at the same time. Haven't had a chance to play the expansion stuff yet, and it's still up here at number 49 for me, so I have a feeling it could bump even higher next year if I get to play a little more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. My number 49 game is a reprint of a fantastic game I got to play a long, long time ago. Always loved getting to the table. St. Petersburg. But the second edition is even better. It gives you a market. It gives you a whole new phase of the game. And that market phase is really great. Nonetheless... Whether you play the basic game or the new version of the game, it, you really enjoy this. So again, this is all about tableau building. You are hiring different uh, workers and artisans in, into your employ so they can produce money. Then you're choosing to build buildings, which are going to typically score you victory points. And then you're working with the nobles. The nobles are going to score you set collections. And then there's some fancy buildings at the end that do all really kind of great stuff and really upgrade your previous buildings. The second edition is super great. The second edition and the first edition are out of print. So, Woo. yeah. That being said, <laughs> you should pick this up because it's a great game. In fact, I think the first edition is on Board Game Arena. Still not as great as the second edition, but check it out. My number 49, St. Petersburg, second edition. I would pick this up if it wasn't out of print and crazy expensive. I'm with you, man. I love this. Yep. But it, yeah, my inability to have played it in the last six years has kept it off my list. Oof. Yeah. Uh, number 48. <clears throat> Blood Rage! <laughs> uh, this is my favorite. You don't say yeah, yeah, you got to say it right. I had to clear my throat a little. Uh, this is my favorite Eric Lang game. It remains my favorite Eric Lang game, despite all the other Eric Lang games that have come out since. 
Um, you are drafting all these various cards. You are throwing guys down. You are blood raging all over the board and trying to score as many points as you can. It looks like a dudes on a map area control game, and it kind of is, but it's also not really. Um, it's a Euro wrapped in an Ameritrash uh, coating. <laughs> I don't know how best to put that, which is most of his games, but this one in particular really stands out. Um, this is one of those games that I would, if someone brought it, I would always say yes. I always enjoy it. Even when it's just like clearly not super balanced, you just, it's fun to play. There's something about Blood Rage where I just want to get this to the table as often as I can. Um, all the extra stuff, all the upgrades, all the fancy stuff that comes with it. I backed the original Kickstarter, so I got all the stuff there to, to jam into it. Um, yeah, Blood Rage for the win, number 48. My number 48 is my preferred play if I'm going to play anything for the galaxy. There's a lot of great games out there. Jump Drive is one that pops in my head. But Roll for the Galaxy has the best production, hands down. You get some incredible dice. You get some wonderful pieces, especially the thick, thick cardboard that comes in the game. You're building up this great tableau. I haven't played Final Frontier yet, but Roll for the Galaxy, all about these alien civilizations that you're able to settle, able to develop, and able to score, hopefully, multiple victory points. The challenge with this game is obviously getting those six-point developments out there. The expansion, or at least the first expansion, makes this game great. Second expansion, hit and miss, from what I hear, but still a fantastic game. Roll for the Galaxy. My own Tom and Lehman game. Yeah. At number 48. That's supposed to be in the 80s. We talked about this. <laughs> All right, number 47 for me is the original Castles of Burgundy, the Castles of Burgundy. Um, this is the board game. <gasps> <laughs> I do still think this is better than the card game, although I probably play the card game more because it's more accessible and I can play it by myself. Um, but I am actually a very big fan of Castles of Burgundy. I'm also a huge Stefan Feld game or fan of his, and this is the one I can get to the table more often because there are a certain number of people who just aren't fans of his games. But this one seems to cross over a little bit more. Um, so I've definitely played it probably the most of any of his games. And that definitely helps. So the Castles of Burgundy, it just, it's a classic formula. You get the two dice. You get, get the tile. You place the tile on the board. And it just works really well. So that's number 47 for me is the Castles of Burgundy. Gotcha. My number 47 is Love Letter Premium Edition. Now, when Love Lover came out, it was a phenomenon. Everybody played it. It was a great competitive four-player game. And it was a very simple game. It's probably one of the simplest games. You get two cards, you play one. If you get knocked out, you're out. The Love Letter Premium Edition did everything that everybody wanted to have happen with Love Letter. First off, these giant, beautiful cards. In addition to that, these giant, beautiful sleeves that the game plays in. Added to that, additional new roles so you could play with more players at the table. So whether you play the four-player version or you play multiple players and add all the different roles, beautiful box, great game from AEG, the Tempest universe, always a fantastic. CJ Kanai knows how to pull together a great little game. Love Letter, premium edition. Lots out there. This is the best. All right. Number 46 for me is Terra Mystica. Uh, this is the first of this type of game that I'm going to talk about. There's a few of them. Um, but this is probably the first like big heavy Euro I played getting into the hobby. Like It came out right at the time I got into it, and it was one of the first ones that got to the table for me, and I still love it to this day. Um, the idea of all these asymmetrical approaches to the same puzzle and trying to, to work out when to do things based on what the scoring tiles are and how to get in there and get the, the landscape that you need and terraform it in a way that other people aren't going to mess with. Um, I really, really enjoy this game, and I don't get to play it as often as I'd like, but part of that is just because a couple of other games come up more often. Um, but with two expansions and a third one presumably scheduled sometime in the next couple of years, this is one that will continue to hit the table into the future. And so it's number 46 for me, Terra Mystica. 46 is, again, a game that has come out in various versions and Castell is my favorite. So imagine these wondrous human pyramids that are built up. Again, you never thought about this as a game mechanic. And as I often say, there's a game that has everything in it. Here, you are actually building up a little tableau. You're actually building up the design that they're trying to put together in this wondrous tower. And also traveling throughout Europe in order to put on these great performances. This game is not a one-trick pony. It has a lot of fantastic mechanics 
I'm a big, big fan of this game. The the bag building that kind of comes in as you pull out these different pieces and try to build out these wonderful human temples. Again, so much fun. That is my number 46, Castell. All right. Number 45 for me. You mentioned this earlier. Smartphone Inc. Uh, this one, I, I did back the Kickstarter. It came in recently, and I've had a chance to play it a few times. And it's really good. I'm glad I remember it being good because it is actually very good. Um, <laughs> that mechanic with the action selection is just so clever and so fun and so brain burning at the same time. Um, you yes. throw in the solo mode that they put in the box with like the little Steve Jobs figure, which is so funny. Um, and some of the upgrades that they offer in that expansion that came with the Kickstarter. And then you can buy separately if you didn't do the Kickstarter. Uh, and this is, it's just a very solid game. It's a shame that it took so long to come over because this came out two years sure. ago at this point. But now that it's here, it's well worth checking out. That's Smartphone Inc. Yeah, sorry I missed the Kickstarter. I have to pick this up. All right, my number 45 is Goa. Now, there's Goa, which you're seeing here, and there's a new edition of Goa, which is a little bit better as far as the game pieces are concerned. Goa is, again, another great game. It reminds me of Skullville. It reminds me of Cuba, where there's different mechanics that come into play. Here, where you place and how everyone places after you and how the movement happens on the board... Again, you are thematically playing out the, the collection of these rare spices, the shipping of these spices, and of course the money and the scoring that goes along with it. This is a game that has been out for so long that people just pass it by, but it's really a fantastic game. That's my number 45, Goa. Number 44 for me is Fort. This is uh, just this cute little card game, and uh, you can steal cards from each other, and you're trying to build out your own little fort i don't know like mechanically speaking it's very simple you're just trying to level up high enough that it, there's a few ways the game can end but level up high enough and score the most points at the end of the game right but it's so accessible and easy to teach that despite the fact you have all these different cards that do different things um my five-year-old plays and my nine-year-old plays and they both have a lot of fun with it and while i have to help her a little bit he's got it hands down it's just this accessible fun just clever asymmetrical style uh family game that you just don't expect to come out you know at this level right look where i could easily play this with my other gamer friends and as a filler and it'd be fun um it just it runs the gannet so i'm really glad they rethemed it and they brought it out as this because uh, the original version was not nearly as accessible just thematically speaking very cool there are two games on this list not just two probably but there's definitely two games on the list and Kingsburg, my number 44, is one of these two games that I like so very much that I bought the reprint. Even though the base game and the original game has nothing wrong with it whatsoever. I own Kingsburg. I own the expansion of Kingsburg, which has been out of print for quite some time. That being said, the new version is just as good. Don't like the artwork as much. But again, this was one of the earliest dice placement games that were out there and really revolutionized the game. So basically, you're rolling your dice, you're checking out how much influence you're going to have and how you're going to influence the various people and nobles in the king and hopefully fight back all the evils invaders that are coming out there. You're getting resources, you're getting military support, you're getting defense, you are building this wonderful kind of tableau of special abilities and buildings. Great, great game. First edition, second edition, it doesn't matter. It's a great game. My number 44, Kingsburg. All right. Moving on to number 43 for me, 1960, The Making of the President, uh, designed by Jason Matthews and Christian Leonard. This is a big asymmetrical two-player game, which apparently is something I love. Uh, and it helps you replay the 1960 presidential election here in the United States. Uh, Jason Matthews, one of the designers on Twilight Struggle and Imperial Struggle. So, you know, it's a big asymmetrical card-based game, right? So you're going to be drawing cards from a shared deck, and these cards will do different things based on what side they're from. And then you're basically trying to put out these different support levels on the different states, in each state representing the different electoral votes. Um, it was a fascinating game the first time I played it a year and a half ago. It's more fascinating now because we're focused so much on the Electoral College of late. Uh, it is a very, very good. They just reprinted this, actually. Um through the p500 that's how i got my copy recently so i think it's actually in print for a short period of time before it Ooh. goes out again if you are interested but 
If you like politics, if you like asymmetrical two-player type of games, definitely recommend 1960 The Making of the President, which is my number 43. And then you can play Watergate afterwards. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Nixon before, Nixon after. <laughs> I've played this once. I really enjoyed it a lot. It would make my top 100 if I played it more. I didn't even realize it came back in print, so I'm definitely going to pick that up. My number 43 is Agricola. Oh, did you all hear that? That was Anthony. That was Anthony there. Uh, it's fine. I'm good. The revised edition. So there's been a lot of versions of Agricola, and I always meant to get it. I eventually picked it up in the revised version. I'm really glad I did because it does correct a lot of the problems with Agricola as far as some of the rules, some of the cards, things like that. The card situation, if you haven't played it before and someone has played it a lot, you're going to have a bad time because the game does involve drafting. So picking up those cards as far as occupations, as far as major and minor improvements are concerned, you really got to know at least somewhat of the game going into it. That being said, it's a great game, one of Uwe Rosenberg's best games that are out there. It's standing the test of time. It's been reprinted multiple times. The revised edition's even better. Check it out, number 43. Agricola, revised edition. All right, moving on. <laughs> number 42 for me is On Mars from Vital Lacerda. Um, this is his most recent game, of course. It came out just about a year ago, not, not even quite. But it just had several just very clever mechanics that I absolutely love. The idea of hopping back and forth between orbit and the planet, just I keep coming back to that. It's such a cool idea because you have to do it, and it's beneficial to do it, but if you do it too often, it's not efficient, right? So you have to find ways to do that in an efficient way, and you also have to make sure that you are doing all the various different things on the planet that are going to help, you know, get you victory points. As any Vitala Serta game, you can't just do one thing. you got to do all the different things. So um, this one is thematically something I very much enjoy. I like these Martian games. But me mechanically speaking, it just, I don't know, it hit that part of my brain <laughs> in terms of the puzzle that I'm solving. And it made sense in a way that not all these games always do. So that's number 42 for me on Mars. My number 42 is another Stefan Fell, the surprising Stefan Fell, Bora Bora. There's so many great things to talk about Bora Bora. Again, very thematic, the idea of these different villagers kind of working together in order to provide, in order to explore the different islands, pick up food, pick up trinkets, craft a number of different things. The tableau building here is great because you decide what powers you add. In addition to that, you decide what scores. So throughout the game, you're going to pick up these different scoring tiles. So maybe you want to score for jewelry, or maybe you want to score for fishing, or any number of different things. You decide what you score, and you decide when you score it. Mm. Really innovative. It's been picked up in another game that will be popping up pretty soon. But nonetheless, this is Fell's most colorful game and a lot of fun. Bora Bora, my number 42. One of his few games I have not played. Ooh, great game, great game. Yeah, I know, I gotta play it. Uh, number 41 for me is Skull King. This is another trick-taking game. So you can see how much my list has changed over the last few years. Wow. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is one of, there's a bunch of games that do this, but this is the best one, I think, where you bid in advance every hand you get. You bid how many tricks you think you're going to win, and you will score points based on if you get your bid correct. So if you bid four, you need to win four tricks or you're going to lose points. You could win five, mm -hmm. no good, you bid four. Um, you can also bid zero, which is a lot of fun, because you can have a good hand and try to get rid of those cards in a creative way. So you have to try to think of like what other people might have. Like Your bids are going to change based on the player count, and there are like a few like cards you throw wrenches in there um, just that break certain mechanics. It's very fun. It's very quick. I've played this dozens of times now in the last year and a half, and my kids absolutely love it. <laughs> I brought it camping, and they've, they've actually had to buy a new copy of the game because they basically have destroyed the cards at this point. So, Skull King, one of the best trick-taking games all around. Highly recommended if you like trick-taking. Nice. Well, my number 41 game is a huge, sprawling, epic game. It is Rising Sun. Japanese mythology, Japanese warring states, giant turtles, and pretty much everything that you could throw into here. It really is kind of like the most felled of a felled that could ever been felled upon a game and yet at the same time just like with blood rage this game is not necessarily all about winning battles in fact there's a lot of ways to win a lot of ways to score points and in fact 
sometimes taking the honorable way out is the way to win this game. So if you're going to play something big and epic and you're going to have Feld on it, it's going to be number 41, Rising Sun. All right. Yeah, you said Blood Rage wrong, but that's okay. I'll, I'll allow it. Uh. <laughs> We didn't get there yet. Maybe just not Oh, yet. you're saving it. Okay, good. Good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's move on to a smaller one from me, number 40. Welcome to. Um, this is a flip and write. So it's like a roll and write, but you flip cards instead. And it is one of the better ones out there. So this one came out recently. You Again, you flip three cards. You choose which combination you want to take. You write on your little sheet, and you're trying to basically score the most points from a combination of different things like swimming pools and parks and all, all the different things that you can do on this sheet. Um, there are like seven or eight different special sheets. Each of them has like one or two mechanics that are a little tweaked. There is also like a sequel to this that in my opinion, severely overcomplicates the game. <laughs> welcome to Las Vegas. And I'm, it's welcome to Las Vegas. Welcome to your, yes. whatever it is. Um, I have that. I, I like this way better. <laughs> honestly like it's one of those situations like a king of tokyo where i'm just like eh, did you really need to add all this stuff i don't know but number 40 for me welcome to it's gonna stay on there for a while this is a it's a go-to for me my number 40 is finally blood rage there we go so we're talking about eric lang then you have to talk about blood rage blood rage is eric lang's most eric lang game now obviously I already talked about Rising Sun, which had, like, everything he could do. But Blood Rage is everything he could do really well. And Blood Rage is Eurogame and Ameritrash the best way possible as far as a four- or five-player game. All the expansions, the Kickstarter. This was the Kickstarter that really kind of kicked off all the kind of, like, FOMO as far as Kickstarters are concerned. All the different expansions, all the upgrade pieces, the later expansion that came out. This is a fantastic game. Definitely worth your time, whether you're a gamer, a Marathrash, all about Ragnarok coming down, and you're doing all you can with your clan to score the most points and gain the most honor and valor. That's my number 40, Blood Rage. Anthony is so blown away by my blood rage. I think I I talk I took his you took voice my voice away, away man. <sighs> it was so much blood rage, <laughs> blood rage. You all could see me doing the yeah, blood I'm rage, doing. but it just wasn't coming out. Um, all right, number thirty nine for me is Clans of Caledonia. This is I mentioned Terra Mystica. This has got like similar mechanics, but it's economic more so. Um, you are a clan of Caledonia. Each of these clans has an asymmetrical power. I wouldn't say they're super balanced, but, you know, they most of them work <laughs> pretty well. Um, like any of these games, nothing's perfect. But in this game, you're going to be placing different pieces down on the board, and you're trying to build the most settlements, you're trying to generate resources, and then you're trying to fulfill contracts. And then there's different scoring mechanics in each round. And that's basically it, but it is just a spectacularly fun... I keep saying spectacular, but it is really a spectacular... Um, a Euro game that doesn't take a crazy amount of time, like 90 minutes or so, and plays really well solo, has a lot of variability to it. No expansions or anything over the years, but one of my favorites. Um, number 39, Clans of Caledonia. All right. My number 39 is higher. It's Coimbra. Whoa. Anthony talked about this earlier. Again, everything good that Anthony said, again, but a little bit higher. The artwork here is unique. And engaging. Eckert Spiel did a great job as far as the production is concerned. What's really fun about this game is not only are you rolling dice, but you're placing dice, and the power of those dice are dependent upon the pips, of course, but also the color. Mm. So the dice themselves become part of the machine, part of the mechanic. You're building up, you're visiting the university, you're building all the monasteries, you're doing everything that's great. Fantastic game, wonderful, whimsical Coimbra. My number 39. Number 38 for me is another LCG, uh, Lord of the Rings, the card game. This is the original in this formula by Nate French, and it's still a, it's still a classic. I still love this game. I have not all of the content like I do for Marvel or Arkham, but as much as it has been in print <laughs> that I can find. Um, you play through all these different adventures in the world of Lord of the Rings. What more can you ask for? It's a spectacular game, and it really does introduce a lot of mechanics to... Um, the LCG format that we're finding in all these other 
games coming out today. So that's <clears> number 38 for me, Lord of the Rings, the card game. My number 38 is Through the Ages, a new story of civilization. Uh, Vidal has done such a great job with this game. The app, we've talked about this app several times. The app is fantastic. You get to play the game, which is great. But even the board game itself, with all its pieces and all its moving parts, the card selection as a civilization game, they really did such a great job. It recently got an expansion. Haven't gotten that yet. But I think it would probably push this game much, much higher. Uh, everything about this game is revolutionary. And how you build up your civilization and all the great things that come along with it. My number 38 through the ages, a new story. Again, new story, better version of Civilization. <laughs> the new, not the old. Um, number 37 for me is Antique A2, Matt Gertz. And this is my favorite mm -hmm. Matt Gertz game. This is... Uh, Ooh. You again, you got a rondel. You gotta love that rondel. The actions in this move so quickly. You just you move on there, you take whatever action is. Most of them are just produce goods or put guys down, and then you move around <clears> occasionally, <throat> and very occasionally you get into a fight. But for the most part, you're trying to complete various objectives that are gonna get you points. You don't need very many points to win. The more players there are, the fewer you need. So it, it's a relatively quick, accessible, and I, I find it very engaging as a Euro. There's not a lot of expansion content for it, but there's two maps. You flip it over and you have another map to play. So that's NTK2, my number 37. My number 37 is Spirit Island, this cooperative game about the spirits and the native people combining forces to push back against the colonists. There's just something so evocative of this theme. There's something so thematic about its gameplay, something so mystical and mysterious about the gods and their asymmetrical powers that come into play, how you're able to control and push back on the island. This has had so many expansions and so many upgrades to it. It's kind of hard to know what the best version is at this point. But someday, some point, I will do that. I'll put together the best version of Spirit Island because it's really a great, great game. Now my number 37, Spirit Island. All right, number 36 for me is The Fox in the Forest Duet. This is another trick-taking game, but it's with a twist. In this one, you are working cooperatively with one other player to try to move and remove these different pieces from the forest. And you have to remove all of them to win the game. And you can make the game more difficult by putting more out there, uh, by starting them closer to the middle of the board, by closing off the ends, but you are playing tricks like a normal trick-taking game back and forth. And so the winner of the trick is going to move a certain amount in either direction based on the little pips on the cards. And that's it, but it's hard, and you can't talk to each other. So <laughs> it's, it's a clever little game, and it's perfect to play with couples or with one other player if you just have some space in a game night. Um, I wish this one was sure. online, honestly, because no communication is perfect. Yeah, I really like this game a lot. It would be on my list as well if I got a chance to uh, play it in person. All right, my next game, my number 36, is Carson City Big Box. Obviously, Carson City's been out for quite some time. This is a wonderful game, really thematic. You're all building up Carson City. You have this wonderful map where you have all these different types of buildings that you're putting out. As the game goes on, they're upgrading. They're giving you more resources. They're more challenging. But... Since it's Carson City, it's all about these outlaws. It's all about the sheriff out there. So you could actually do have a you know shootout in order to claim those different land areas. This is really fun. Now, on top of all of that, again, there's this really innovative kind of like worker placement element or action place element where you place your actions out and then they resolve in order. So again, what you're picking, when you're picking, how you're scoring – all up to this situation. You get to make all those decisions. And on top of which, why I'm recommending the big box version is because it has all of the different roles. Because the roles in this game are going to give you special benefits each round. They're going to do a lot of different things in order to benefit you. So picking the roles and when do you pick them, big part of this game. My number 36, Carson City, big box. Number 35 for me is The Crew. This one just came out this year, actually. Won the Kenner Spiel this year. <laughs> and it's another cooperative trick-taking game. Um, this one, though, you can play with up to four people. And you will each be trying to complete a... There's different objectives that come out. And the order in which they have to happen sometimes changes. And so maybe, like, 
I have to win the five, the green five, and you have to win the pink three, but in a certain order. Um, this one also no communication, so there is an online implementation on Board Game Arena, and it's perfect. It's just a, a great way to play this. Highly recommend it if you enjoy trick taking, if you want something different, something cooperative, where you're not just doing the same thing back and forth. The Crew, the quest for Planet Nine. Very cool. All right. Well, my number 35 is Empire's Age of Discovery. This is a really interesting mechanic as far as action placement. And then when you pull the actions off is when you're going to get your special abilities. And again, these are European conquistadors, explorers, invaders. And, you know, they're exploring the new land. They're expanding out there. And again, what's really interesting about this game is how you go about choosing your actions. There's a lot of ways to play. You can play very vicious. You can be very warlike. You can be very diplomatic. You can bring religion into play throughout the game. And again, you are building up special abilities. You are picking up resources throughout the game. It's basically a area control game in the new lands. Beautiful production. This was a big Kickstarter way back in the day. Great game. Check it out. Empire's Age of Discovery. All right. Number 34 for me is Keyforge. All the Keyforge. Any Keyforge. It's all good. Um, <laughs> this is the Call of the Archons picture here, but this is just the first set. I think there's been four sets now. Um, I'm actually in a tournament right now playing this online. So Keyforge is one of my favorite card games ever made. I've had a blast playing it. I've made a lot of friends playing it. And it's, I don't know, it takes that thing about magic that got me when I was younger and it makes it more accessible and way less expensive. And that's thumbs up for me. <laughs> um, the unique deck thing is cool. And obviously every deck is a little bit different, but at the end of the day, it's the mechanics themselves that are a lot of fun. It's Keyforge. My number 34 is Clinic Deluxe Edition. Anthony already talked about this, so I'm going to jump on the Albin VR train here and stop at the Clinic because it is a fantastic game, very thematic to the healthcare systems that are out there, both good and bad as far as treating patients in need, as Anthony mentioned, multiple expansions, including the COVID-19 expansion, where everyone's working together in order to deal with that pandemic. And really, I mean, this is probably one of the best games, his culmination of all his great mechanics, the spatial puzzle building and the movement throughout the game, the upgrading of the components and the pieces, dealing with all the patients as they go throughout. Fantastic game. Number 34, Clinic deluxe edition all right number 33 for me is gentis um chris already talked about this so i agree with everything he said and a little bit more <clears throat> um it's stefan reesthaus uh I've, I've liked every game he's released to date um this is the same designer as arc or arkwright and uh just the clever use of time like that idea of time as a mechanic in the game and how you utilize that in a game about generations and um you know family trees it's just such a cool take on the idea of civilization and progeny in, in board games. And uh, yeah, it's a blast to play. So that's my number 33, Gentis. My number 33 is Small World. Again, I guess if I was going to own a company, it'd be Days of Wonder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Back before the Asmo Day days. Uh, Small World is a reprint, reimagination of Vinci. It was all about the idea that you had these civilizations that throughout time would explore, would conquer, and then eventually would go into decline. And then new civilizations would come back and take over. But you don't have to worry about that. It's all fantasy artwork. So, again, what's beautiful here is you have a race. It has a special ability, but you also have something added to that. So, uh, souped-up ability together with your race, going to make up unique combinations. This has a ton of expansions. They're all great. They're all needed. They really add a lot to the game. A lot of fun. Area control. Deterministic gameplay. Super fun. My number 33. All right. Number 32 for me is PAX Pamir 2nd Edition. Uh, this was designed by Cole Worley and released by Worley Gig Games last year, year before. I don't remember exactly when. Um, but this was kickstarted as an upgraded version of a very tiny little box with not amazing artwork. Mm -hmm. And now it just looks spectacular. You get this nice cloth roll out. You get these big little pillars that act as your walls and your roads and your troops. And then the cards themselves have beautiful artwork on them. Um, mechanically, this game is just 
a, it's just so clever. Like it really utilizes the theme in terms of how you actually play through these. You have these three different factions fighting over the land in Afghanistan. It's the kind of theme that I'd like to see in board games, but also to be accessible because a lot of times these types of themes are not very accessible. And I'm not saying this game is particularly accessible, but it's more so than like a four hour war game, right? So PAX Premier Second Edition, I want to see more games like this. I want to have more experiences like this in board gaming, which is why this is my number 32. It's just one of the better experiences of last year um, as a game. My number 32 is Rococo Deluxe Edition. I'm saying Deluxe Edition because Ian O'Toole artwork. I guess Anthony's going to agree with me on that. But beyond that, the expansion, the jewelry box, has been out of print for quite some time. The Deluxe Edition is Deluxe, although the regular version is also fantastic. I love both. I'm going to be owning both. So this is another game I'm going to be owning both editions and really enjoy getting to the table. Again, you're dealing with this extravagant period of all time. Beautiful dresses. Beautiful suit coats, beautiful decorations, fireworks, everything as lavish as can be. This deluxe edition does a great job showing off those times. In addition to that, you are dealing with a really smart card mechanic where you're purchasing and building up your own deck, but you got to play all of it. So it becomes a lot of troubling, a lot more interesting, and, uh, you know, a lot of fun. My number 32, Rococo Deluxe Edition. All right, number 31 for me is The King's Dilemma. Uh, I picked this one up at Gen Con last year and actually got a chance to play it, uh, not all the way through because we, we did get interrupted by COVID, but we were a good ways into this. We had a few games under our belt, and it's pure negotiation. I'm not even a huge fan of negotiation, but the way this game implements it and the different <laughs> ways you have to vote on all these various things that come up, and then the randomness of like all these different envelopes that you can pull out based on like where these cards land at the end of each round. Um, it's so clever. Like you're just arguing with each other and arguing with each other until the king dies <laughs> in some form or another. And then you save that progress and carry it forward. It is a legacy game in the purest sense, um, but it's not big bloated with all these extra mechanics, it's all about the interactions between the players. It's the kind of experience that's hard to describe. It's just like, you should go play it if you can I know that it was impossible to find for a while, but it's probably not so hard now because nobody can really get it to the table. Um, the King's Dilemma, once you do have a chance to play this in the future, I highly, highly recommend it, and I'm looking forward to finishing my game. All right, well, my number 31 here is Glory to Rome. The I'm going to go with the Black Box Edition. I don't have the Black Box Edition. I have the fun cartoony version. <laughs> but my friend does have the black box edition and super jealous about it, but I did get a chance to play it. He knows who he is. And I'm, and I'm just, just looking at that. and just so jealous. I'm like, ah, oh, it's the good version of it. This was a game that has a stored history behind it. It was kickstarted. It was destroyed. It rose from the grave. All the things that you could possibly imagine. Glory to Rome. You are building up Rome. You are dealing with all of the interesting card mechanics. This is the multi-use card game of all time. It's definitely the game. Uh, Russ knows all about this. And again, how you build up, what you shoot for, what you score, all in one box. Glory to Rome. Fantastic. Fantastic game. All right. Moving on now to number 30 for me, Underwater Cities. This is uh, Vladimir Suchi's, <laughs> well, I guess not his most recent game anymore. He's got a new one out. But um, this is the sure. game that when we first played it at PAX, I was like, oh, this is what they should have done in Terraforming Mars. <laughs> this is how they should have <laughs> fixed that problem. Uh, you are building out your own tableau of your underwater city. And, of course, you're trying to produce all these various goods by building up the little plants. And you do this with this hand of cards. And the cards are split up by the three different stages of the game and you have a limited number of cards you can hold in your hand at any time. So you can't have like 30 cards in your hand, half of which you can never use again at the end of the game. The cards make sense for the time at which you have them. Um, sure. The, it's just, it's tighter. It's better. I don't know. It's more cohesive. It takes a lot of those ideas of like this kind of tableau building style of game where you're building something um, out of the cards, what their cards are doing, and it does it in a very clever and interesting way. So Underwater Cities is a lot of fun. I play it solo all the time, 
and the new expansion is very difficult if you play it solo i have yet to beat it so it's it's on my list Mm. to try to knock out my number 30 game is citadels citadels again is another one of those games that i liked it so much i have the original game with its expansion and picked up the new version of it citadels is again one of those games that defies categorization you think it's just going to be this hidden role game, right? So it's not a hidden player game because you're going to pick a role, and then based upon that role, you're going to be able to do that action unless a thief steals from you or maybe an assassin takes you out. That being said, there's a lot of other roles in the game, and it's a lot of fun because it's a rock, paper, scissor kind of situation of who blocks who and how. So some of my most fun times in board gaming came out from Citadel's, And it's all about building up your Citadel. So the different buildings have special abilities. How you score them and such is different every time. The new version is probably a little bit better because there's a lot more to it. But even if you have the original version, both great. My number 30, Citadels. Number 29 for me is Kanban. Um, I I guess technically the driver's edition is what I have, but the new version is coming out um, very soon. So similar to how you described Rococo where you're like, I don't have it yet, but that one. The better one. That one. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kanban is a Vitala Serta game in which you are making cars. It's about the production of cars. You have all these different locations in the car factory where you're going to go to get parts and to build the cars, to push them down to the test track. Um, you're going to go to the boardroom. You're going to vote on different things. And it's, again, like a Vitala Serta game, all these things interconnect. You can't just focus on one area. you got to do everything creatively. And then there's this basically timer moving down the center track and how many actions you get to take. Um, this is such a clever, interesting take on the idea of manufacturing and how he, how he does that in the game. And I had not played this for a long time. We actually got a chance to play it when I visited back in February. And I'm very, very excited for the new version of this game. Um, I did not order the metal cars cause I think that's dumb, but I don't know. You got to draw your line somewhere, I guess. <laughs> cause some of the <laughs> stuff I own, you know, I'm, you know, glass houses and all, but uh, number 29, <laughs> Kanban. Uh, very excited for the new edition coming out next year. Yeah, this probably would have made my table if I didn't accidentally flip the table. <laughs> so <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but if you're going to mention it, I don't know. <laughs> I'm going to mention it. I really feel bad about that because I was really enjoying what I was playing until the game went flying. So, yeah, yeah I'm looking forward to the future version where the cars fly in the sky. <laughs> my... Number 29, Caverna, the Cave Farmers. <laughs> Anthony already talked about this. I'm bringing it up a notch because it's that hot of a game. We should also mention Lost Tribes that came out recently that actually creates different factions that you're able to play. It's something more. Not super much, but it's something more. Uh, Caverna's great. It's it's basically Agricola, but instead of cards, everything's out there for everyone to see. Lots of ways to win, lots of ways to feed your people, lots of ways to build up your cave and your forest. A lot of fun. My number 29, Caverna of the Cave Farmers. I agree. <laughs> uh, number 28 for me is Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. And you might be saying, 28? I thought you really liked this game. I do, but it is incredibly <laughs> hard to play. Uh, it's hard to get a group yeah. together for it anyways. And in 2020, obviously this game has not happened. So it is suffered because of it um i don't foresee playing it again for at least another year and that makes it difficult to put any higher than this you're going to notice a lot of solo games coming up sure um but in terms of game experiences this game is so spectacularly fun i said spectacular again Uh, (laughs) but it's worth it it's worth that use of spectacular um it's just like you know seven to eight hours five or six of your best buds sitting around and just yelling at each other and trying to work out um, how best to, to deal with each of these situations. It seems like a big dude on, dudes on a map type of game, but it's really not. Mechanically, you're not just going into fight. If you're fighting, you're doing it for a reason. And I love that in games where you're not just doing it because that's the mechanic, you're doing it because that's the goal you have that other people don't know about. And that's Twilight Imperium 4th Edition. And that's why it's my number 28. Very nice. My number 28 is Seven Wonders Duel. Seven Wonders Duel has been a favorite two-player game of mine of all time. I love Seven Wonders. Could be higher up on the list. And Seven Wonders Duel does a great two-player game. You are building your wondrous civilization from this pyramid of cards. There are 
two expansions to it. Haven't played the most recent one yet, but hope to get to the table. The Pantheon expansion makes the game better for me. This game can be played online on Board Game Arena. It's a lot of fun. It's quick. It's simple. And yet it's so dynamic. It's definitely one of those games that's a, a you know takes a minute to learn, but a lifetime to master. Seven Wonders, Duel, Civilization, at the two-player version. All right. Number 27 for me is Leaving Earth. This is a very mathy, <laughs> borderline simulation type of game of building rockets and exploring the uh, solar system. Um, it is... It's a strange game because it's not made by any of the major publishers. I think it's still self-made by the Luminaris Group, which is, I believe, owned by the designer. And it comes in like in a shoebox, which is wrapped wow. in paper. It's very pretty. Like, it's very well done. You think it'd be lower quality, but like the cards are high quality. The artwork's fantastic. Um, very much that 60s deco um, space style of art like you see on the cover there. Um, it has two or three expansions for it now that help you go beyond just exploring to the moon. You can go to Mars, you can go to the outer planets, you can go to Mercury. Um, it's it's a lot of math, it's a lot of puzzle, and for some people, you look at that and you're like, nope. Um, for me, it's it's a lot of fun. I really enjoy it. I don't recommend playing it with like the full group of people. It's not great with like three or four people. It's like a one or two person kind of game. But uh, Leaving Earth is has been consistently up here for me because it is such a good game, and I always look forward to playing it. Number 27. My number 27 is Seven Wonders. One of my favorite games of all time has been number one at one point. The expansions really kind of built out the game. Great. And recently got a reprint and some recorrections to the game as far as some of the cards and some of the balancing issues are concerned. Leaders, cities, adds a lot to the game. Uh, obviously there's a lot more coming. They're not done with it yet. And really so fantastic to have a civilization game that is the card drafting game. And it just, it pops each and every time. Again, it's another game that's a minute to learn, a lifetime to master. And again, a lot of fun. Seven Wonders is my number 27. All right, number 26 for me is Arkham Horror, uh, the card game or LCG. Uh, this is mm -hmm. the best of these. Like, I think I have all three of them on the top 100 because I like all of them. This is the best one. It has the best mechanics, has the best progression system, the best story, um, plays best solo, mm -hmm. all of the things. So everything I said about Lord of the Rings or Marvel, but a little bit better. And it's Cthulhu, so that's why Marvel is up there because I'd rather play that. I like that mechanic. Or I like that theme better. But this is just all around a better game. So if you're looking for an LCG and you do like Cthulhu, and even if you don't but don't mind, Arkham Horror, the card game, is uh, very, very good. I agree. My number 26 is Suburba, the collector's edition. Suburbia has been on my list and Anthony's list since the very beginning. We both love Suburbia, and it's so much fun to get to the table. I have all of the expansions for this. I unfortunately don't have the collector's edition, but there's no denying the wondrous production that they recently had on their Kickstarter and the endless number <laughs> and colors of the different cities that you're able to build up. Yeah, this is a game that eventually hopefully will get into my collection, but as it is, I have everything from Suburbia and I love it so very much. You are building up some of the best Tableau tile placing games that's out there. Suburbia. My number 26. All right, number 25 for me. It's the big guy, Feast for Odin. <laughs> this is uh, uh, Uwe Rosenberg's magnum opus. It's his biggest, sprawlingest, largest boxed game yet. Uh, it has all the things in it. You're, you're going everywhere. <laughs> you're doing everything. You're hunting. You're whaling. You're foraging. You're trading. You're pillaging. Everything you can think of, it's all in there. Big sprawling board with lots of different action spaces for the workers. You got to feed your Vikings at the end of the day. You can emigrate off into another land at the end to get yourself more points. And there's polyominoes going on your board. So uh, I love it. There's so much going on here. It is sandboxy, but there's some direction given to it. And the expansion with the Norwegian stuff gives you a little bit more direction. It revises the whole action board. Gives you some more options there. Gives you a fifth placement, um, kind of as a omega action where you can play your, place your last guy of the round and get like a bonus for it. Um, yeah, Feast for Odin's fantastic. My number 20 
five is Star Trek Ascendancy. There's been some amazing Star Trek games out there, but Star Trek Ascendancy really does the different factions best. It is a big, sprawling, Twilight Imperium-like game where you're building up all these different space routes. You're really dealing with the civilization's different benefits and different uh, penalties throughout the game. You are doing all the fun things of Star Trek as far as visiting new locations, dealing with all the problems and the challenges and the mysteries of those locations, and again, of course, dealing with all the factions. It's got a Borg expansion. It's got all the fun that you could possibly want. And uh, Gale Force 9 has done a great job here. That is my number 25, Star Trek Ascendancy. All right. Number 24 for me is Detective, a modern crime board game. Uh, this one is the uh, Portal Games' take on Sherlock Holmes, basically. Um, you are going through these various different cases. Like the base game, they're all related to each other. And there's an expansion. They're all related to each other and some other stuff. Downloadable content. Um, but you have an app that you can go into. It has like a database of information it's sift through. There's clues and whatnot you'll pull up in the game. And at the end of the day, it's almost like sandboxy detective work where you use the internet to fill in the gaps, which I, to some of you sounds horrible, but to me, it's a lot of fun because you are trying to solve this complicated puzzle of a game. You can play it solo, of course, because it's cooperative. It's incredibly hard if you play it by yourself, though. Like you really have to hit all the clues. So I've done it both ways, but it is one of my favorite um, deduction style games out there. That's Detective. It's why it's my number 24. My number 24 is Villagers. Again, one of these kind of deceptive small box games that really has so much life to it. When I got this to the table finally and we played it, it was automatically a replay and automatically a replay and a replay and a replay. And again, a wonderful tableau builder about all these artisans that you're bringing into your village in order to benefit and also score as many points as possible. It is supply chain management at its best. <laughs> you not only score points based upon what you're doing, but you're scoring points based on what other people are doing. It's sleek. It's simple. The expansion is necessary. It's a must. It makes the game so much better. My number 24 is Villagers. I agree. Yeah, it's a good game. Uh, 23 for me, Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. You mentioned this earlier. I have still mm -hmm. never played this in cardboard, um, but I've played the app a lot, and it is very, very good. <laughs> um, it, it's one of those games, like, I love Civilization games, but they're often a little too overwrought. They're difficult to get to the table. They're hard to teach. This is the kind of game where I feel like those things might even still be true, but I haven't had to do that. And so I've had a chance to play it and enjoy it, and digital implementation is so good um, that you're getting the full experience. Now I've pulled it out and I've set up the game and I've run through it a little bit solo. So like I know what I'd be getting with the cards uh, on the table, but yeah, through the ages, a new story of civilization. I'm happy to own this. I also need to pick up the expansion. Haven't had a chance to do that yet, but uh, yeah, that's why it's my number 23. My number 23 is Arcadia quest. So there are so many different miniature games to talk about, and especially in that hack and slash thing. We talked about adorable in board games. This has adorable in spades. There are so many expansions. There are so many individual characters. But you get to build up a team. Certain teams work better than other teams. You are going for certain victory conditions. So it's not really a hack and slash, although it can be if you want it to be. You're not only attacking the bad guys, but you can also attack each other in order to score points. It has a legacy mechanic in order to kind of build up your weapons, your team, and kind of build out the story. There's so much to the game. Unfortunately, it doesn't get as much time as it deserves because, again, you just want to own all of it. Just for its wonderful game appeal. This is a great game by Simon Games. Love getting this game to the table. Should get it to more. My number 23, Arcadia Quest. I don't think this is on my list, but I don't think I can't remember the last time I played it either, despite the hundreds of dollars worth of stuff I own for it. Yeah. All right. Number 22 for me is another Vlada Shavadal game, Mage Knight board game. Uh, this is mm. generally considered like the ultimate solo game uh, until very recently when Spirit Island kind of hit the hit the table. But it is a sprawling adventure game in which you are building up a deck of cards and trying to take on various challenges. And there are a few different scenarios with which to do so. There's an ultimate edition of this, of this game now that comes with all the various expansions that have come out over the years and some of the promos that maybe you didn't get before. 
Um, so you can either get the original or you can get that. But either way, this is, if you play solo games, this is a game you should play at least once. It plays up to four, don't do that. It takes like way too long. <laughs> the downtime is horrible. But if you're playing by yourself, downtime doesn't matter because you're just thinking. So um, Mage Knight the board game is my number 22, and it's a game when I get it out, I play it multiple times because it's well worth just sitting down to go through. Always want to play it, never been able to play it, want to play the Star Trek version. Star Trek version is very good. <laughs> My number 22 is The Voyages of Marco Polo. I told you it was going to be here. So <laughs> Marco meets Polo. This is the original version. You don't travel as much, but it's a lot tighter. And that's in some ways, makes the game a lot more fun. Add in the expansion that really opens the game up in a good way. And it's just such a great game. It's, it's almost the quintessential Euro game. It's hard to say. Yeah but it's right up there with the rest of them. So my number 22, The Voyages of Marco Polo. All right. Number 21 for me is Legends of Endor. This is my favorite adventure game, and the reason why is because it's not like your traditional adventure games, which are move a guy, roll some dice. Uh, this has a time mechanic, which limits how much you can do and when where you can go. So you can't just go everywhere on the map and do everything and hopefully get everything done. You have a limited amount of resource in the form of time to actually solve the puzzle that's in front of you. And it's the story kind of goes from one game to the next and carries you through. When you first play the game, there's not even really a rule book. It just says start playing and we'll teach you as you go on the cards, <laughs> which is great. Um, that's great. There are three of these, I think now like big boxes. And then there's a kid's version coming out as well. Uh, so lots Ooh. and lots of content. If you really like Andor, which I do, um, this is from legendary graphic designer as well, Michael Menzel. It's like his board game that he's made. So, yeah, yeah it's it's one of those games. The first time I played it, I was like, I have to have everything for this now. This is so good. Never got a chance to play it. Really jealous that you've gotten a chance to play it. It looks like such a lot of fun as far as a board game is concerned. So, yeah, that's great. My number 21 is Amerigo. This is, again, one of my favorite Stefan Feld games. And, again... It is a great game because it utilizes so many of the different mechanics. First off, you can see in the back of the image here, there's a cube tower. Yeah. <laughs> and based on what cubes come out, allows you to see what actions you can take place. That is so much fun. Add to that asymmetrical kind of gameplay as far as picking up the different powers are concerned. Not super gameplay, but special powers. Add to that on top of which the kind of exploring and building options that are, go on in the game, it gives you a very tiny polyomino feel as far as building up those different lands. Lots of way to play the game, lots of fun. Uh, Queen Games has done a great job here. Uh, Stefan Feld, Americo. Yeah, I love this game. I wish I got it to the table more. It's just one of those big, lunky boxes that's hard to move around. Yes. All right, so moving on to number 20 for me, uh, Star Wars Rebellion. So we're getting into some, Woo, yeah, some heavy 20, hitters baby. here. Um, <laughs> Star Wars Rebellion is, guess what? A big asymmetrical two-player game. <laughs> Apparently it's my favorite thing. Uh, you either play the Empire or you play the Rebels. And you play through Star Wars. It's got everything from Star Wars in there. Um, it's, and, and like, it's never going to be like the exact story of the Star Wars trilogy, but that's, all the stuff from it is in there. You get to play as these different characters. The card mechanics are fantastic in terms of how you play your actions out. Obviously, it's very asymmetrical, and Empire is going to have way more resources out there to do stuff, but they're trying to find the Rebels, who therefore have a little more leeway because they have the information on where they are and can hide and move around and, and mess with them. Um, it's, I don't know. It's, it's one of those games that it's hard to describe because of all the different things that can happen, and every time you end up starting to describe it, you really just describe one game of it. You don't describe the game itself. Um, the expansion is really good. Highly recommended because it enhances the combat a little bit, which is more interesting, like the cinematic combat. Um, yeah, if you like Star Wars, if you like big, meaty board games, this is the best Star Wars board game, in my opinion. And if you have someone else to play it with, you should. Uh, Star Wars Rebellion. Very cool. My number 20 is a big, big box game. A lot of fun, over the top in every way. Deceptively kind of, it looks cute, it looks fun, it looks interesting, and it's just super crunchy, <laughs> super dynamic. 
And what's really great about this game is usually when you play games, you're like, you know when I did the thing and it did another thing and it did another thing? Well, here, you are controlling all these different guilds. And as you do a thing, almost all of them kind of trigger at some point. So you get that really great snowball action. You also get to control a lot of different areas. And you also get to control some really interesting monsters throughout the game, which you would not think in this kind of like Euro game, it would have such fantasy elements to it. It's definitely crunchy. It, it's card action is super unique throughout the game. And I love it. It's my number 20, Feudum. You still have to teach me this game. It's been like three <laughs> years and we're like, you got to teach me this game. Like, yeah, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man feudum uh number 19 for me is seven wonders duel this is a little bit higher on my list uh i think than yours but it's just the first time i played it i was like well this is my new favorite two-player game and that's with all these other two-player games on the list as well it's quick yeah. it is so like everything is so well balanced you can win in any of these various different ways and i have you know it's it's you choose a direction you go that direction and it, you don't always get to do what you want to do because the other player outplays you um seven wonders duel is just that perfect 20 to 30 minute filler two-player game i can play it with pretty much anybody and with the, all these different digital implementations now i do play it with pretty much anybody <laughs> so uh that's my number 19 seven wonders duel my number 19 is concordia anthony already talked about this again this is one of those weird strange situations where i've played this game almost as much as any game I've played, and yet I don't own a copy of yeah. it. Uh, Matt Gertz, I mean, this is my Matt Gertz game. I mean, I love all of Matt Gertz's game. I could talk for hours about Matt Gertz's games, but this game just somehow s s is just above and beyond. Anthony already mentioned all the maps, different ways to play the game, the Salsa expansion, the Venus expansion, where you can kind of play two-player teams. Lots of fun. But just the idea here of you're building a deck up, to take actions and those cards become the scoring opportunities for you at the end of the game so again the quintessential trading in the mediterranean game one of the best games of all time number 19 concordia all right number 18 is a new one uh lost ruins of arnak i just talked about this a couple mm. episodes ago um gave it a buy and it's legit been stuck in my head lately i've been playing this one a lot uh it plays really well solo which helps obviously get this one to the table more often but yeah it's definitely one of my favorite games of this year and has jumped way up on my list so i'm excited to see where it stays because will there be expansion content is there more variability here obviously there's two different ways to play it out of the box already um but yeah mm -hmm. it was a big surprise for me because it, it looks generic on the cover but when you really get into it there's a lot of meaty unique mechanics in the box very cool my number 18 is a game Anthony talked about earlier, the Manhattan Project Energy Empire. It, again, very deceptive as far as the tile is concerned, but super innovative. Really great game. So the idea here is you're generating energy, but how do you go about it? There are cleaner ways and there are dirty ways. And based on that, you're going to pick up dice that are based upon how you're producing energy, hopefully getting a lot of energy at it without getting some toxicity throughout the game. But as you get these toxic symbols that come up and pollute the water, pollute the land, you have to deal with that as well. You're going to lose points. You are operating as one of the countries, and you're also dealing with the UN and how you deal with each other. There's a lot of resources. There's a lot of special abilities you can pick up through this game. Again, I think this game is a classic game. I think this is going to be remembered as one of the kind of cult favorites, one of the best games of all time. But again, because it has Manhattan Project, which those two games are not bad, it kind of gets lost and it deserves to get played. Number 18, the Manhattan Project, Energy Empire. All right. Uh, number 17, one of my all-time favorites. You guys hear me talk about it, I would say, every, every year, but it's probably like every month, maybe every week. Um, Spirium! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's... In engine building game, you're building out a tableau of these various tiles, and the cool way that you get them is by placing your little workers and then removing your little workers in the second round. It's so fun. It and like there's an online implementation on Board Game Arena. I do play a lot of async games. I can't play this game async because there's dozens and dozens of actions. It should be an hour long game. I really wish I could get it to the actual table more often, and I wish they'd do an upgraded mm -hmm. deluxe version of this because I think people would really enjoy it. 
Um, an expansion would also be great. Really anything. Give me something, guys. <laughs> Spiria, <laughs> number 17. You're killing this guy. You're yeah, killing him. More. <laughs> My number 17 game is the game Anthony talked about before. It is Fort. So imagine if you would... One of the greatest games of all time, Glory to Rome. Now imagine it, kid version. And imagine you have this really cool fort that you're trying to build up with your best friends. And you're inviting other friends to help you build it up. And all your friends have special abilities that are very kid-based. And you have pizza, you have toys, and you're having a lot of fun. But if you don't play with your friends, they're going to get played with by somebody else they're going to head out the park and maybe someone else picks them up as best friends again a very simplified version of glory to rome in a lot of ways because basically what you're doing is multi-use cards you're building up your fort but you're also building up a lot of ways to score quick points boom 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 i scored points so forth and so on great game number 17 fort fort uh number 16 for me is gaia project this is the sequel to terra mystica and you must be wondering why would you have Terra Mystica and Gaia Project on your list? And I would say to you, because uh, I like both of them, and I've kept them both, and I still play both of them. <laughs> um, this does take a lot of the mechanics of Terra Mystica, but it does change them in a few ways. Like, you don't have the temple track, now you have a technology tree, and you move up the track, and you gain all these various benefits and bonuses. Um, the various factions are a little more balanced. You don't have a static board anymore. It's more modular, and you place, like, satellites out to connect everything. It has a solo version out of the box, like, in almost every way, it's better than Terra Mystica. But it's not so similar that you can't play both, in my opinion. I know some people disagree. But for me, I, I do like both of these games enough to have them on here. And Gaia Project is just such a strong Euro game. Um, I don't see any need for expansion for this. And I haven't heard anything about it either. So, yeah, if, if you want one of these games, this is the best one, in my opinion. Gaia Project at number 16. My number 16 is Mombasa. This is one of my favorite games of all time. And let's put aside some other things, some problematic things. Uh, Alexander Pfister has done a great job here. The card mechanic that you're utilizing in order to take actions, but also build piles of cards that later you're going to select as your next couple of actions. Smart, fun, innovative, a lot of different things to do. The market mechanic is a lot of fun. Typically mark mechanics are pretty dry. This one has a lot of dynamic nature to it and you can flip it around. You can play it different ways. Really a great game. Mombasa on my number 16. All right. Moving on to number 15 for me, Russian railroads. Choo -choo. This is uh, <laughs> my favorite worker <laughs> placement game. Uh, and I am, I am considering German railroads in here. Although I really did enjoy this game quite a bit, even before German railroads came out. Um, but I've had the expansion mm -hmm. since day one, so I've just kind of, it's part of the game for me. <clears throat> I do agree that it should be in the box and that both should be in print so you can get them. Um, but yeah, just in terms of like a snowballing point machine of a game, Russian Railroads is so much fun. And there are lots of good online implementations. I wish they would add German Railroads to them. Um, but yeah, I would play this game almost any day of the week. Absolutely love it. Russian Railroads. Well, my next big game here is a game that is not being printed, but it's certainly a game you should play. So we're talking about big, dynamic, fantasy war games, but yet at the same time, a ton of Euro elements and a game in the Terranoff universe that does have the elves. So we are talking about Rune Wars. There was a super big coffin box version and a smaller kind of easier to get to the table version. Both versions are, are great. I don't think this will be coming back into print, and it really breaks my heart because you should be playing this. Yeah. This is a great game. You do have your hero character out there. You do have your wonderful factions, different ways to build them up, somewhat asymmetrical as far as what they benefit from, what units they have to the table. Really a great game. So much fun. My number 15 game, Rune Wars. All right, number... Uh, 14 for me is Gloomhaven. Uh, this one's fallen a little bit in the last year or so just because it's not really getting played quite as much. I mean, it's we've talked about this before. It is a brilliant game. It's a fantastic take on dungeon crawling. The mechanics it introduces to the, the system in general are being used by other games, and people are rethinking how to do this type of game because of Gloomhaven. 
And I, I I love it for that. I've loved it since day one. It's been so much fun. But it is kind of samey out of the same box. You have like 100 plus different scenarios. And then eventually, at a certain point, you just don't want to keep playing those over and over again. Or at least I haven't wanted to. So it hasn't really hit the table a whole bunch in the last year or so. And it has dropped as a result. I still look at it and think, man, this is a good game. And man, do I love it and I want to play it more. I just haven't played it more. So it's dropped down a little bit. But if you're looking for the ultimate dungeon crawler, in my experience, in my opinion, um, it's Gloomhaven. All right, my number 14 is Scythe. This is a Stegmeier production game, and really, it's a great game. Stonemeyer does great games. They do great productions. The artwork here is fantastic and just admired, you know, all around. Again, this is a, a, a bit of a Marathrash, but I would say... 80% of it or so is a Euro game. Again, it's this alternate kind of World War One universe where everyone's able to build up these wonderful mechs that do a lot of good stuff and not so good stuff. Your population's dealing with the fallout from these different wars. They are the backbone of your civilization. So this game is great, but this game is so much better with the Scythe. Uh, Rise of Fenris expansion that really adds so much more to the game and so much more that I can't say here but it offers different ways to play Scythe. You can go more Euro, you can go more War and again, a lot more stuff I can't say here but again, Scythe is a great game, my number 14. Alright, moving on to my number 13 is The Gallerist. This is my favorite Vitala Serta game and part of it is that it's just so beautiful to look at um, you know, to an art worker, obviously, but all, then they also went above and beyond and they're sourcing the different art pieces that are actually in the game from different places. Mm -hmm. um, mechanically, it is not his simplest game, but it's his most accessible, in my opinion. It's you have one worker, it moves to one of four locations, you take one of eight actions. I could teach this game in about 20 minutes. <laughs> it's relatively easy to keep track of what other people are trying to do, but it's got emergent complexity in a lot of different ways because you only have those eight actions, but like what you do with them and the order in which you do them is very important. Sure. It's not the longest of his games either. You can play it in like 90 minutes. You could theoretically play it twice in a row without you know, having all these pieces set up. So it, it's just like that perfect balance for me. It's not so overwrought that I have to reread the rules every time I play it, but it has just enough complexity to feel like a Lacerda game. And uh, that's why it's my number 13, The Gallerist. My number 13 is Shipyard. Again, it is a classic game that is needed in a serious reprint. Vladimir Suchi, he's all over my top 100. And probably more of his games would be there if I had an opportunity to play them. But Shipyard is one of those old classic games that I do love so much. Again, you are you know building up, using cardboard tokens and such, you're building up ships. Small ships, big ships, putting people on the ships, captains, old crew all different little bits, and then you're sailing them through these little map pieces. Rondells, my friend, if you do like Rondells, Suchi's got Rondells for you for days. Not to mention the fact that on top of everything else, and I talked about this a bit in Bora Bora, you get to pick your own scoring conditions. So, again, lots of fun. Shipyard, Vladimir Suchi, thank you again, my number 13. All right, number 12 for me. You already talked about this, The Voyages of Marco Polo. I I agree. This is like one of the ultimate just medium weight Euro games. Like if you're going to recommend one to anybody, this is the one I would probably throw out there. I've played this game well over 100 times. Every single time I still enjoy it. I find something new, exciting, different about it. It's tight. It's limited. You have to do the most you can with what you have. And that's the type of game I enjoy most. So for Voyages of Marco Polo is number 12 for me. Wonderful. My number 12 is a big, sprawling, you know, just massive warring factions on the map uh, from a, you know, a great company, Academy Games. This is Marinostrum Empires. This is a reprint remastering of the great Marinostrum. Here, there's a lot of ways to win. You can win economically, get enough money. You can win by the gods and by the temples. Or you can win out by all-out war throughout this game. Beautiful production. One of the best productions in board gaming that was out there, especially at the time. Still stands up. Great maps. Great game. Absolutely a need to play. Probably haven't played it. Definitely need to. My number 12, Marinostrum Empires. 
All right, number 11 on my list is Nations. This is, I think, one of three or four different civilization games on my top 100, but this one in particular is my favorite. Um, it's card-based. You have a limited tableau on which to place your various uh, bits and pieces of your civilization. So if you <laughs> want to build something new and they're all full, you got to get rid of one. Um, you have a limited number of yes. workers. You have to feed everybody. So if you produce more workers, you just have to produce more food. Um, there is a huge, huge deck of cards to draw from. You're not going to see all of them. If you play the game 10 times in a row, you're not going to see all of them probably. And they come out based on the various different eras and ages of the game. Uh, when it first came out, it was way too expensive. And I think that pushed a lot of people away. It's much more accessible now, even though I think the MSRP is still too high. But I just don't see it out there as much as I feel like I should. Nations plus the expansion, Dynasty, very, very good. My favorite Civilization game, and that's why it's my number 11. Wow. My number 11 is Dominaire. I already talked about Love Letter Premium Edition. And again, this is from the wonderful AEG Tempest universe. So here, you are utilizing the different political figures, the different commoners, the different artisans, the different religious figures in order to gain power and influence. As you gain power and influence, you gain reputation, which is great, but it's also exposure. So people see that you're making the moves that you're making. So it's an area control game as you're controlling different factions and different areas of power, but also you have to play it very much on the down low. This is a phenomenal game that, again, because there's so many games in the Tempest universe, it's often overlooked, but it is one of the best games. I know it was our friend Drew's favorite game of all time way back when, and it's definitely been one of my favorite games. So definitely something to check out. My number 11, Dominaire. Still never got a chance to play that. You guys, Ooh, so good. I know you guys brought it out all the time, and I just, I, don't, I was never there, I guess. <laughs> All right, we are on to the top 10, and it looks like we're a little out of order, so I'll just go ahead and skip ahead. Um, my number 10 of all time is Imperial Settlers. This is... It's Imperial Settlers, man. It's <laughs> There's a bunch of different versions of this game now. There's Empires of the North came out last year. They haven't released any new content for Imperial Settlers vanilla in a little while, but there's... The idea is you have your own faction. It's one of several different civilizations. And some of them are like fantasy civilizations now too. Like the, I think you have the Atlanteans are in there and the Amazons. Um, <laughs> and then there's also a central deck and you have a drafting mechanic for those central cards and you're building out a tableau and you're trying to produce all these different things and then using the things you produce to take various different actions. And then you can attack each other and break each other's buildings, which it's, it's just so much fun. Um, it has a fantastic solo mode. It has an upgraded solo mode with a campaign. Um, all this different content can, means you can do deck building as well. So you don't just have to use the stuff that comes out of the box. Imperial Settlers is, it. it's not, I don't consider it a pure civilization game because it's more like a tableau building kind of card game. But with that civilization theme, it really elevates it for me. So that's my number 10 of all time, Imperial Settlers. Very cool, very cool. My number 10 game of all time is a new big box version, Tricarion Collector's Edition. This is all about, I guess, wondrous steampunk magical performances that you're able to put on. The original version from Mind Clash Games was good. The new version with the Academy, with an apprentice, and with some revisions in the gameplay and the rules, really elevates this game to the epic version. This is a game that's very hard to get out because it's such a big game. And if you know Mind Clash, you understand why. Yeah. <laughs> but that being said, it's such a great game that this game has hit the table many times despite its epic nature and just huge box. If you haven't played it, your carry on. Really, again, it is all about building up your magical tricks, getting the resources necessary, putting on the performances, going down the dark alleys for some special prophecies throughout the game thematic throughout the way great game to carry on collector's edition definitely recommend my number 10 yeah i got this in recently I, the first time i played it was with you the original and I, I still need to get this collector's edition to the table all right number nine for me is terraforming mars this is mm. the 
I mean, I love me some Mars games, and I love <laughs> there's a lot of space games on my list. Um, and this one in particular, the combination of you know the tableau building and the the puzzle, the efficiency puzzle that you're trying to work through, and one of the best solo um, games versions that you have in any Euro that's on the market today. Um, made Terraforming Mars my most played game for two years in a row, right when it came out. I've played it less of late. Sure. It is definitely, you know, starting to show its age in terms of my collection, but uh, it's still one of my favorite games of all time for all the different things it does, even if you have to kind of mix and match the content to get it where you need it to be. Um, Terraforming Mars, number nine. My number nine is Dominant Species. Anthony talked about this earlier. This is the classic cubes and cones board game that you know when you think about a nightmarish board game situation where you're going to be bored out of your mind you think this yep. <laughs> i mean it's so much that it was mocked in parks and recreation so i too mock this game from a distance when i was like why would i want to play a game that is just cubes and cones and stuff like that and then you play it and you're like oh no this is one of the best games of all time yeah. the <laughs> The dynamic nature of it, how you are growing and passing on your traits to different civilizations and how you're also managing the different food supplies that are out there, how you're managing all of the traumatic activities that happen throughout the game. Whew, it is a bear of a game to play. You're constantly sweating it. You never feel safe. The Ice Age is coming. Volcanoes are blowing up. Cats and dogs living together. I mean, it's just... It is everything. I've also backed the uh, ocean version of this as well. But until then, Dominant Species is dominant at my number nine spot. Well earned. Number eight for me, Suburbia Collector's Edition. Uh, Suburbia has been in or around my top ten for several years. And the Collector's Edition just pushed it a little higher. Because you're taking one of the best games ever made and one of my favorite games, period, about city building, which is just a just a fun thing to do. I played Sin City for a billion hours when I was a child. And <laughs> then you make it like the blinged out super mega cube version of that with like 25 different cities and all these extra tiles and every expansion ever released. And I backed the heck out of this game and I, I absolutely love it. It's just one of the best games on my shelf. I'm just happy to own it. Um, Ted Allspec Suburbia. Yeah. Number... It deserves to be up here, and I'm surprised. Like, if honestly, if we weren't in the middle of a pandemic, it might even have moved up a little higher if I'd gotten to play it a little more this year. Um, but yeah, number eight, Suburbia Collector's Edition. Yeah, probably would have been higher for me if I was able to back it. So okay. yeah, my number eight is Twilight Imperium Fourth Edition. So again, let's talk about games you never thought you would like. You never thought you'd get to the table. And just, again, blow you away. This is one of the wondrous things about the hobby. There is so many different types of experience out there in board gaming. And each and every time, I'm surprised, I'm shocked, I'm enthralled by these things. Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, again, 3rd Edition, I've heard from a distance. Multiple days it takes to play. 4th Edition, got to the table multiple times, even up until the whole pandemic kind of hit. Love this game. Shocked by this game. Enjoy this game in so many different ways. The factions do play so differently. The new expansion is going to add so much more to the game. I don't know what else to say about this game. I don't own a copy of this game. I wish I did just to keep it in my collection. Even at the high price point, even though I would never get my copy to the table, it's still worth owning. Twilight Imperium, the fourth edition, is my number eight. Oh, yeah. So good. All right, number seven for me, you talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, Brass Birmingham. This is mm -hmm. almost everything you said about it, it holds for me true. Like Lanc yes. Lancaster is good. It's I yes. played it. I liked it. It's fine. Birmingham mm -hmm. is just a level above that. Like the way that things yes. are cleaned up, the addition of the beer to be required to deliver certain things, the way the ports are, you know, the where you sell things are organized. Um, the board, mm -hmm. the map, everything is just so perfectly balanced. This game is just, every single time I play it, I feel like I find another layer in there. And I've played this a lot. Mm. This was on our 10 by 10 We've played it a lot, both in person and online. Um, and yeah, it's just such a fantastic game. I do have the Kickstarter versions, although there's not a huge difference between those and the retail, except for the chips. Um, you do get the bigger box, I guess, which is nice. 
Uh, but yeah, it's just so much prettier. Like this is like a new, like all Euro games now are coming out, and they're like, oh, we gotta we gotta up our game. We gotta be like brass. We can't look like the old version of brass. We gotta look like the new version of brass. Um, and I think this and among others are some of the reason we're seeing a lot of those prettier, more accessible, broader appeal, visually, you know, interesting euros coming to the market. Um, yeah, it's spectacular. It's great. And it's, uh, probably at the moment, at least one of my favorite, you know, euros in this weight. Yeah. Board Game Arena needs to pick this up. Yeah. It's great. Oh my God. That'd be amazing. <laughs> My number seven game is War of the Ring 2nd Edition. I could imagine this might be higher for Anthony, but number seven is pretty high for me considering how many times I've gotten this to the table. This could easily be my number one game of all time. Big Lords of the Ring fan. And yet at the same time, it's got great expansions. It's got great thematic play. You're not necessarily, although it's possible, you're playing the exact book out. But nonetheless... There's so much thematic play here, but stop. If you're not into into War of the Ring, if you're not into any of the Lord of the Rings kind of stuff, the Hobbit, any of that stuff, you will still love this game. Mm -hmm. The hidden movement actions of this game is so much fun, so dynamic. You sweat as you're moving (laughs) your hobbits throughout the map and hoping that you don't get caught. At the same time, you have to balance your war movements and what you're going to do there. So it's it just fits so very well, so thematic. Love the game. My number seven, War of the Rings, second edition. Yep, more on that later. <laughs> <gasps> Shock it all. <laughs> number <laughs> six for me. Uh, this is my highest rated splatter game, The Great Zimbabwe. This is their in my of the ones you can actually get or could get recently. This is the quickest and. I'm not going to say most accessible because it is a little hard to wrap your head around the basic mechanics, but it's fast. It's an easy game to get to the table. It takes like an hour and a half, right? Um, Some of their games are like four or five hours long. This is not one of them. This is a game in which you have asymmetrical god powers that you don't start the game with. You select them as an action on your turn. So they're all out there and anybody might take them. You have special uh, additional abilities you can pick up. Um, You have Mm. this really clever auction mechanic where based on your victory point conditions you will lead a different position in the auction order um and that's going to be for the turn order of when you go first like you're going to auction to go first um which matters a lot because the resources are limited on the board in terms of being able to fulfill uh certain things and actually gain victory points and raise your monument which is the whole point of the game right it is such a good game and every single time like i say this a lot about games but every time i play it it's a little bit different i try to do something a little bit different and it turns out sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't and it's all about outplaying your opponents right and the coolest thing about this game is that you're not necessarily just trying to hit like who the first person to get to 20 points no because you could get a bunch of powerful cards that make your victory condition 30 points and someone else only needs 22 points and someone else needs 27 points you have more powerful stuff but now the game is harder to win for you right so it's all about balancing that and figuring out when to move and how to move and super super tactical so the great zimbabwe has really grown on me i've played it i don't know a couple dozen times in the last year year and a half and uh yeah it is my favorite splatter game for all those reasons it's very easy to play online as well if um if you have not done so so great zimbabwe number six my number six is Star Wars Rebellion. We just talked about War of the Rings Second Edition as being the ultimate thematic IP version of a game. Well, Star Wars Rebellion is the ultimate thematic version of Star Wars, the original trilogy, with a little extra kind of thrown in with its expansion. The expansion definitely upgrades it as far as a lot of the actions that you're going to be able to take, a lot of the fighting that you're going to be able to take. But here you literally have the opportunity to move around these little plastic Death Stars yeah. and take out planets. <laughs> and again, you have space battles, you have land battles, you have everything you could possibly want, all the characters. And again, the story can play out differently. It doesn't have to play out, again, uh, how the original trilogy plays out. Lots of ways to play this game. Hidden mechanics, very much like War of the Ring. I mean, it owes so much to War of the Ring as it is. As far as trying to hide your base, 
trying to get out of there in time because the Empire is so big and powerful throughout and the Rebellion is doing a lot of Rebellion-like things. Whew, great game, fantastic gameplay. Whether or not you like the IP does not matter. You will love this game. My number six, Star Wars Rebellion. All right. Number five for me, you mentioned a little bit earlier, Watergate from Matthias Kramer. Uh, this one just shot way up my list. I don't know. Like, Once I got my hands on this, the first time I played it, I was like, I want to play again. Okay, now let's play again. Okay, now we got to play it again. we got to play it again and again and again and again. Um, it's It plays fast. It plays uh, differently every time. The asymmetry is like perfectly balanced here. And each side feels so different and yet unique. And the decisions are hard on both sides. And when you're playing one side, you look at the other side, and you're like, that's not fair. Why do you get to do that? I want to do that. And that's a perfect sign of like a well-balanced game. So, you know, the theme obviously is not as universal as like a Seven Wonders Duel. But in terms of small box two-player games, this is my favorite. Number five, Watergate. My number five is Defenders of the Realm. This was one of my number one games of all time. Unfortunately, it doesn't get the tabletop time that it really needs. Richard Lanius recently utilized this mechanic in Freedom originally went up on Kickstarter. This is the best version for me. This is the best version because it utilizes such the great artwork of Larry Elmore. It takes you back to all of those wondrous D&D games. So many different heroes that are played in here utilizes the pandemic mechanic probably in the best way possible and some of the most gripping dice rolling that you're ever going to do in a board game. You really feel the dread. You really feel the terror each step of the way and your heroic battles that you have. My number five is Defenders of the Realm. All right. Number four for me, uh, also earlier on your list, Spirit Island. This is the best cooperative game, period. It's just, it's like you take the complexity of like a Terra Mystica or a Gaia project and you slap it on top of a in-depth cooperative game where you basically remove the ability for people to alpha each other because you're spending so much time thinking about what you're trying to do. Um, it makes it very difficult, but also very fulfilling to play this solo as well, especially if you're multi-handing and using multiple spirits. Uh, the digital implementation needs some work, but it's still very good if you're playing alone. It's just the variability out of the box in this game is so big. So many different ways to play it. I've played this dozens of times and not even gotten close to playing it all the different ways you can. That's why it's my number four, Spirit Island. My number four is a smaller game, but really wonderful. First Class, All Aboard the Orient Express. This was a game Anthony talked about earlier. Again, one of the things he may not have mentioned is all the different modules that come with the game. So not only do you get to build all these wonderful tracks, you get to score based upon what you're building, you get to travel all the way up on your track. So very similar to Shipyard in that way as far as building up your train traveling your train but also there is actually a murder mystery on the yeah. orient <laughs> that you can play in this game like why why would that be even be a thing and it's a thing and it's wonderful and again it gets to the table it plays great so many ways to play this love this game so very much Whew. number four first class all aboard the orient express all right number three for me Teotihuacan, City of Gods, Daniel Sashini again, hitting it every time. Uh, this is, when it first came out, I knew it was going to be good. I demoed it early on before it was even released, and I was like, oh, this seems great. And so I pre-ordered it, and it was coming. And then since it came out, I was increasingly playing this game more and more and more. And right now, especially because they released it on Board Game Arena, I've been playing this constantly. I almost always have a game of this going. I think I've played it 30 or 40 times this year. Um, a lot of it online, but a lot of it solo, some of it with the family. Like, I just keep coming back to this game. And part of the reason that I love it so much is that the mechanic is as simple as it gets. Move one of your dice to one of these available spaces and do that thing. And you're trying to generate resources and then use those to build a pyramid or put out decorations or move up the track of the dead. And it's, you know, on paper, you're like, well, you're not really doing very much. But at the end of the day, it's like, the efficiency of how you do those things, the order in which you do them, how frequently you do them, 
if you're able to get somewhere first, like the challenge of trying to rise up as many of those temple tracks as possible. And then you throw the expansion on top of it with the asymmetrical powers that not only give you something really good, but also something really bad. Like, hey, you're really good at getting masks now. You get lots of bonus points for that. But also you can't go on this space at all or it's going to cost double, right? You always have to pay double sure. to, to use something someone else is using. So you can't just, you're not just suddenly better, you're also worse in some ways. Like this game... I don't know, it captures everything I like about Euros and distills it down to, like, basic elements, and it's just, I don't know, it's fantastic because of that. So, Teotihuacan is is steadily risen. This was on my list last year, but it's higher this year. Number three. My number three game is Bruges. This is my favorite Stefan Feld. Again, multi-use cards. Think Glory to Rome, but also think San Juan, because since the cards have so many uses... You also expend the cards for resources, for people. The expansion makes this game even better. Again, I do love this game so very much. I back the new version of this, but we'll definitely keep this version of it. The artwork here is wonderful. It really evokes that kind of image of building up that city and also being able to welcome in all of these wonderful artisans and visitors throughout. It is a great game. Again, because it's been out of print, and especially its expansion has been nowhere to be found, it just doesn't get the table time it deserves. Wonderful game. Looking forward to the new version. But again, Bruges is a modern-day classic from Stefan Feld. Great job. Wonderful job. Love the game. My number three, Bruges. All right. My number two game of all time is Root, <laughs> a game of woodland might and right. Uh, this is the second game from Cole Worley here on the list. And it is uh, a purely <clears throat> asymmetrical game. So you're playing one of these woodland factions. The base game comes with the four that you see there. You've got the birds, the cats, the vagabond, and the woodland alliance, the little mouse up there in the top. And each of them has a very different way that they go about doing things. The core mechanics remain the same. The way you move is generally the same. The way you fight is generally the same with some tweaks. But how you get things on the board, how you score points, how you even take your turn might be completely different. So it takes the idea of a game like Vast, which was really cool, but incredibly difficult to teach and even harder to actually do well at, and distills it down into a simpler form and then uses a war game as kind of the structure. So this is basically a coin game, which those are also asymmetrical war games, but way more accessible. Like regular gamers who don't want to read a 50-page rulebook can sit down and play Root. And then they've added multiple additional factions on top of that. So there's four additional factions you can play. You've got the lizards and the otters. Um, you've got the the little mole people. <laughs> you've got the ravens. And they all do something very different and unique and interesting. And now you have multiple boards as well. So the game is a little wonky in terms of the rules. They've been tweaking them over the years because of all those different a asymmetrical factions. But at the end of the day, like sitting down and playing as these cute little raccoon going around stabbing people and stealing their stuff is just so much fun. <laughs> or the birds where you're just like these hoity-toity birds, and you have to program everything, and then it breaks, and you're like, fall into disarray. Um, yeah, Root is such a spectacularly fun game. It is one of the best asymmetrical games I've ever played, and one of the best war games. So, number two. Yeah, if I owned this game, I would literally go around to village to village and teach this game, because it's so great. Yeah. <laughs> My number two game is Vitalis Serta's, in my opinion, one his greatest game. It's hard to say, because he has so many great games, but Lisboa, 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 Lisboa. So great that a friend of mine who did not like the game loved the artwork so much that he actually framed the game board. Let me say <laughs> that. Now, beyond that, Lisboa, all about these tragedies that visited the city. Again, thematic gameplay at its best at a Euro game. So you are rebuilding the city and you're utilizing the rubble, same as the city did, in order to rebuild this city in order to deal with the bureaucracy, to deal with the red tape, to deal with the church, gaining special abilities, choosing, again, one of my favorite mechanics, what will score in the game, and building a wonderful tableau. Again, these cards have multi-uses. So will you use it to cut through the red tape? Will you use it to build up the cities? And throughout the game, the errors are changing. So, man, what a wonderful game. What a great invention that... B. Talisterda has given to us my number two, Lisboa. All right. And then my number one game of all time, 
I'm going to get these out of the way so you can actually see these boards. <laughs> we have... It's the same as last year. Y'all know what it is. War of the Rings! <laughs> <laughs> uh, from the very first time I played this game, I knew it was going to be my favorite game. And I spent a large amount of time learning how to play this. I dragged it with me on vacation. I watched through uh, Ricky Royal's videos on the car ride home from vacation. Um, I set it up. I went through it on my own to play. And this was all before the first time Chris and I played it. And and, and I knew doing all that, I'm like, this game's amazing. I really need to play this. <laughs> it's Lord of the Rings in a box. It's the whole trilogy. It's all there. And it feels like you're doing it. And like some things come out in different orders, but it doesn't matter, right? It's not... Like, Star Wars Rebellion is also Star Wars in a box, but it comes out in a really random order because it's, you know, you get stuff when you get it. This game is, yeah. you know, you are going to destroy the ring or you are stopping them. And obviously the game doesn't always end with destroying the ring, but, you know, you're trying to. That's the goal. Um, and it's just that core mechanic with the cards and the different types of cards that you're going to pull up and use and then the dice... Um, and how they're different for both factions and what you're able to do with them. Uh, it's just, it's so good. And we've seen it in other games. We've seen it in the sequel to this game in Battle of Five Armies. Um, but other games have kind of utilized similar mechanics. And it just none of them have done it nearly as well. Um, expansions are really good. Uh, Lords of Middle Earth, especially if you want like some fanfic type of situations that go outside of the normal realms of the, the trilogy. Um, fantastic. And if you want Ents, Warriors of Middle Earth for you. Um, War of the Ring, my favorite game of all time, has been for several years. Even though I don't get to play it nearly as much as I'd like to, it stays up there because it's just so good. Mm -hmm. Absolutely wonderful. All right, now to my number one game of all time. I always had hoped and had looked for if there was going to be a game better than Terraforming Mars. And when I had the opportunity at PAX Unplugged, to play Underwater Cities, I was honestly blown away. In fact, when the, the game actually broke up because somebody had to leave, I was just livid. <laughs> I was like, no, I want to continue to play what was turning into a four-hour game yeah. because we were still learning the game. And I was like, you can't leave. I haven't completed my Underwater City. <laughs> and... Again, Vladimir Suchi. You're seeing a trend here. Vladimir, Vladimir, Vladimir Suchi. And here we are. Tableau building. Right? We have building up of a literal underwater city. You have a little board. You have your little aquaspheres that are kind of being placed out. You have all of these different elements that come into play. You have your funny and unique and uniformed artwork throughout the game. And it's not Mars, but it's another wonderment of the world down there. And here's what puts it over the top. The expansion. Anthony already talked about this. Great expansion. Upgrades all the pieces that everyone had a little bit of an issue with. Double, double boards here. And again, it adds new cards. And again, it's, it's one of those situations when you play a Euro game, you want to build up something substantial. Here, you're allowed to do that without any of the chaff that you get in a lot of other games. You're able to build up your combos. You're able to pick up what cards you want. You're able to deal with all the different technologies. You get to choose, again, how you're going to build up, how you're going to score, and based upon what you're dealing with and being this wondrous underwater architect in underwater cities. My number one game of all time. Wow. Yeah, that one shot up there. That's awesome. <laughs> all right everyone there you go our number 300 episode my number 100 games of all time anthony's number 100 games of all time please if any of these games has triggered whatsoever interest in you we have over 300 episodes and i guarantee you we've covered all of these games in one form or the other in all of our episodes <laughs> right. so Check back on BoardGamersAnonymous.com. You can search our massive catalog of articles, our massive catalog of multiple podcasts and videos. Seven plus years, 300 plus episodes just for this, all of the Patreon episodes. 
it's all there. It's all for you. It's why we do this. Again, thank you everyone who's on our Twitch stream tonight, our family, our friends, our Patreon backers. You mean so much to us. That's why we do this. Obviously, everyone listening, thank you so much. Continue to listen. Again, it's why we do this. Please spread the podcast. Please spread board gaming. There's so much goodness out there. Until next time, Anthony, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you all a seat at the table.